Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to TwitWow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans, by wrestling fans, on the web today. I'm John, that's my cohort and commentary Ashton, and this is our WrestleMania 32 and post-WrestleMania Raw review. That's right, folks. Double freaking feature coming at you right now. As promised at the conclusion of our post-WrestleMania Raw live reactions last night, we were going to be coming at you tonight with a more in-depth analysis of both shows. And boy, are we about to plunder our hands into some dirt as far as WrestleMania is concerned. But there was a consensus before we went on the air that we actually both really enjoyed the post-WrestleMania Raw, so that'll probably be far more lighthearted and positive. But, brother, I mean, just starting with this mania, man, what a pile of garbage. What did you uh, think, man? Yeah, dude, this was a really, really bad WrestleMania. Um, was it the worst WrestleMania of all time? Probably not. I know that there are probably a lot of people that would definitely make arguments for other WrestleManias having been worse. Uh, what I did say personally at the end of the show was that this is the worst WrestleMania that I've personally ever watched from beginning to end live. Uh, I started watching wrestling in 1998, so immediately my you know the bar was set relatively high for me, and... I do think that this WrestleMania ranks down sort of in that WrestleMania 27 slash 29 range. But I personally, again, just in my opinion, this is the worst of the last, I guess, like 18 years or so of WrestleManias. Here's where I stand with this mania, right? I'm actually glad that we're doing this, if for no other reason, because I can finally articulate my thoughts fully. And you're not going to just uh, extrapolate my opinion from a few sound bites. You know what I mean? What angers me about this mania and why I color this mania a failure, I feel like the undercard killed it. For more or less, they did really well. They did what they set out to do. The same undercard that WWE, more often or not, passes over for the tired and the familiar. And then when we get to the marquee matches, mostly including the tired and the familiar, to me, they failed. And, and that, to me, is important. An undercard can be strong, and that's what I think kept it from being the worst WrestleMania of all time. I'm not going to commit hyperbole here. But I think you have to color the biggest show that they have of the year, you know, WrestleMania, a failure when the marquee matches or the matches that they truly believe when they put it on the card. That exemplifies WrestleMania above all else. When they bomb, to me, just the logical conclusion, the show bombs. And I feel like the Hell in a Cell was atrocious. Main event, you know, we'll get into that. I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about that. And and just really all those big matches. I mean, Ambrose Lesnar, I can't wait to get into that. Just all under-delivered to me. And that's why I have to call this WrestleMania a failure. So am I going to be just visceral and be like, worst WrestleMania of all time made my eyes bleed? No, because I feel like the undercard actually carried this freaking show on their backs, especially the women, which again, we'll get to. But as far as the marquee matches go... Way to fucking just fart, guys, instead of being hot shit. Seriously, like, totally drop the ball, man. Totally drop the ball. Yeah, and you know what? Since we normally begin our twit wows with Heat of the Night, uh, let's just kind of treat WrestleMania as a whole as our Heat of the Night. Yeah, I mean, I agree because... Because even... the general theme of Heat of the Night is to get the negative out of the way and then the Raw review is nice and smooth, and it, we try and stay as positive as possible. Now, granted, that hasn't really been happening over the last month or so, but I think tonight we can actually do that. We can call WrestleMania the heat of the night, and then our Raw review can just be our Raw review. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree, because even with, and guys, again, I have to plug this, because I know Ashton plugged it on the post-WrestleMania Raw live reactions. If you guys haven't joined Pletoff, that is, Pro Wrestling is taking over Facebook, do it and look at Ashton's WrestleMania rant because as he rightly points out in my book, even the stuff that was good and that may be just the bulk of it praise when we review it, there were still problems. I mean, I don't think there was one single, to put it one way, Ashton, home run on right. this show. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think your rant brilliantly illustrated that. So, guys, if you haven't seen it yet, go join Pletoff. 
check it out. Believe me, it is a worthwhile read. If you think I'm capable of salt, or even that Ashton's capable of salt from your personal viewing experiences, you don't know what salt is. <laughs> I felt like my sodium levels spiked just reading it. So check that out. But yeah, Ashton, I mean, do you want to just go through the card? Like, you know, uh, do you even want to talk about the pre-show or is this just main card or how do you want to handle this? Yeah, let's just kind of work through it uh, match by match. We'll include a couple of the non-match segments that were a little bit more prominent. Uh, first, though, let's talk about to me, what was honestly the third or maybe fourth best match at WrestleMania, Kalisto versus Ryback for the U.S. title. This was a really, really good match. But the ending, like most of the endings on this entire card, was nonsensical. I completely agree. You know, here you have Kalisto, who I like the idea that he's a proud, you know, a Mexican wrestler, you know, proud of his heritage this and that, you know, wants to be a great luchador, great United States champion. And he cited Eddie Guerrero especially and Rey Mysterio here and there multiple times. And John Cena. And John Cena. Yes, that is true. John Cena as well. And, you know, like just thinking about Eddie Guerrero, if they wanted to make Kalisto that kind of champion, it should be an established fact. It should be an actual facet of his personality. But it's not. Kalisto's personality is I'm an underdog that fights until the bitter end. He either fights until he loses or he finds a way to win. Really, He's basically every... Rey Mysterio, but they tried to treat him more like Eddie Guerrero in this match. Exactly, which I think is problematic because there was that's no precedent not... for it. There was no precedent for it. To me, when you watch a Kalisto match, at least if you're you know a supporter of Kalisto and you're looking at Kalisto, you should always look at it as Kalisto's in a war of attrition because he's always going to try and outlast the other guy. Yep. He didn't outlast Ryback. Ryback ate turn by And if anything, that's another problem, too. Not only is this like a pre-established fact of Kalisto's personality, like, oh, look at me being so cutesy with my cheaty way to win, it actually puts sympathy on Ryback, who is the heel. Because, oh, he would have had this match won had he not eaten the turnbuckle that he didn't even expose in the first place. I mean, that's the big point here, people. If Ryback exposed it, I even feel like I could have given this a pass. But if I remember correctly, Kalisto exposed it, albeit ac accidentally. But still, you know, it all lies with him. And then Ryback eats it. So, I mean, what does that say? Now, I love Kalisto. I think the uh, sky's the limit for him. But with booking like this... It's always going to come off a bit awkward to me. So great match, though. Just a really weird booking decision to kind of set up the finish. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that we can kind of leave the discussion on that match off at that, right? Yeah, absolutely. OK, up next, we had Team Total Divas versus Team Bad and Blonde. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say it. This match was a lot better than I think either one of us expected it to be. Uh Y'all completely agree. Completely Lana, agree. Lana was impressive. Eva Marie was impressive. The only botch that happened in this entire match was on behalf of Naomi, and even that was recovered from relatively quickly. Uh, we had some, some pretty decent kind of finisher exchanges towards the end of the match, and then the finish came when Brie Bella locked, I believe it was Lana, in a yes lock and got Lana to tap out. You know, I have to say, maybe this is me giving the match too much credit, and I'm not saying it was a perfect match by any means, but I think from a booking perspective, this may have actually been one of the stronger matches on the entire show, because the people that really are, like, the weakest workers, I feel like they got the least amount of time. Like, Eva yeah. wasn't in the match very long, whereas the people that really could work, like, Emma, I feel like, was the, one of the best workers in that match, if not yeah. the best worker. Right. And I feel like she worked... A majority of the match we were so even actually, kind of talking during live reactions and i said that the three best workers in this match are emma natalia and alicia fox right right and i feel like yeah emma worked a good chunk of that match and then you know the finish coming down with brie uh you know i don't know why she didn't tap out lana because she was the one that you know she's been kind of feuding with because i believe she tapped out naomi correct i thought uh, she tapped out lana did you think she tapped out? Maybe, maybe I'm pretty sure right. she did, yeah. I, I thought it was Naomi personally, which didn't really make any sense. Oh, yeah, to me. you're right. You're right. It was Naomi. I'm actually looking at notes now, and it was Naomi. You're right. Okay, yeah. So then I, I reiterate my point. It made no sense to me because it was Lana that yeah. she had the beef with, and Lana That's kept true. getting the upper hand on her. So your comeuppance is, is that you beat Lana's team, but not necessarily Lana. Yeah. And, I mean, look, it's not even that I'm not a fan of the Bellas, which it's true. I'm not a fan of the Bellas. But, I mean, it's kind of weird when you, you know, win – on your way out. I mean, AJ only got away with it because she didn't let the company know that she was leaving until after WrestleMania. So she pretty much took the win for herself and then informed him afterwards, oh, yeah, I'm leaving. 
But uh, I guess that just shows you how much the WWE really valued the Bellas, I guess, to have them win, or at least Brie win, on the way out. We don't know what Nikki's in-ring future is. Which well, I we will know that say, she uh, is guaranteed not to be full-time in the future. Yeah, yeah, That's actually man. a report that came out last week that Nikki Bella's full-time in-ring career is over, and that if she ever wants to wrestle again, it's going to have to be on a part-time basis. Right. That's... That's crazy, man, these injuries that but are... But I think she just might a, just be retiring, honestly. I, I think so, too. I think if Bree's going, Nikki's probably going to go. I mean, how much longer... Well, I really shouldn't ask how much longer can we expect John Cena to go, because, I mean, he'll always surprise us. But, you know, maybe, maybe they just both go. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it now and act like I was a fan of them the entire time. You know, I wasn't. But I will say it, it was pretty cool. It's the last hurrah for them both. You know, they get the ring one last time, whatever. Um, so yeah, not a bad match. And I feel like from a booking perspective, like who wore what portions, this may have been one of the more intelligent matches on the show. So well done. Yeah. Uh, up next was the final match on the pre-show, the Usos and the Dudley boys. And, uh, you know, this was kind of one of those matches where I just didn't give a crap about the whole thing. And I just was waiting for it to be over and then it was over. And then the Usos acted more heelish. Yeah. To me, I mean, I, I liked the Usos when there was a reason to be sympathetic towards them. You know, they had yet to be WWE Tag Team Champions. I thought they were fun, but it, it gets old very quickly, <laughs> and I'm just kind of over them. And especially considering what we got the next night, which I'm not going to talk about here. We'll get to it when we get to it. That's actually excitement in the tag team division. And to me... Uh, you know, it, just them winning this match. I should have seen it coming, honestly, because it's the Usos and it's Mania. But I actually thought they'd give the Dudleys the rub here. You guys knew my reasons in preview and predictions. I thought the Dudleys were on track for a WWE Tag Team Championship program with Babyface New Day. Now, I have no idea what's going to happen in that department. But again, we'll talk about all that later. And yeah, the, the match was just... it. It was boring to me. It was absolutely boring to me. And honestly, maybe this is just like my, my indie, smarky, kind of salty side coming out. But it annoys me anymore when I see the Usos go on their super kick sprees because all I could think to myself is, oh, man, I wish I was watching a Young Bucks match right now instead. Like, that's really my thought process. And, uh, yeah, Usos are terrible. I, I'm just glad that, you know, Heel Dudleys uh, could move on. Uh, but, yeah, Usos did get the win here, and then they put – Dudley's through tables because you know that's that's just great so yeah this match just was for me yeah. just really bad and that was the end of the pre-show but before we move on to the main show there was one other segment on the pre-show that's worth talking about that being lita's in-ring announcement and the uh revelation of the new wwe women's championship oh my god i loved it this was great um, you know, you and I, we love the championship. I love that there isn't even like a smidge of, you know, quote unquote, like femininity yeah. going on with it. You know, no, no, like butterflies, really like obnoxious colors. And that's another thing too. the, uh, oh, the color you know, scheme of the though, title. I think that the, the slightest bit of femininity is that it's basically the Valentine's day colors, the red and white. You know what? I'll allow it, though, because yeah. I, li I like the color scheme, actually. And I was just about to say it, so I'm not going to backtrack on it now that you you know rightly pointed that out. I, I love, too, that it's really just a female version of the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, because that, to me, is what equality you know should be. Like We don't have to go out of our way to explicitly say, like, hey, this is a women's belt. No, you know it's a women's belt when the kick-ass women are waging war over it. You know That's how you freaking know it. So, yeah, I thought this presentation was awesome. Really cool to see Lita doing the presenting. You know, I thought somebody like her or Trish or Al Alundra Blaze, you know, so I'm glad they got Lita. I think perfect choice. And yeah, love the title. And it seems unanimous. Like everybody seems to love the championship. I haven't encountered a negative opinion yet. And considering we've only had three women's titles, at least in my history, the WWE Women's Championship, you know, in the like Attitude Era, Ruthless Aggression Age. That wasn't the even the WWE Women's Championship. It was just the Women's Championship. Just the Women's That's Championship. It's different. Yeah, this one's yeah. different because it's specifically WWE branded. Right, right. Well, I can definitely tell you it's my favorite of the three by far. Back when I mean, Moolah was holding it hostage back in her time, that wasn't under the WWE umbrella. Right, right. That, I think that was technically part of the NWA umbrella. Well, the great part is, is it didn't make a comeback, which I know you didn't want it to. And we've no, got a total. Yeah. Because of Moolah, because freaking Moolah was a, a horrible human being. Yeah. Scumbag. And, you know, now that that history can just 
settle where it is yeah. and the Divas Championship is retired. Now we can create a whole new history that's exclusive to WWE, which I am excited about in one way because we do have a lot of quality women, but and we still have such a long That's another funny thing, too, is like I love how all the people that were talking about how they wanted to bring the Women's Championship back, like the original, even if they were ignorant to the fabulous Moolah's uh, you know, questionable at best past – this is the same championship that Candace Michelle held. How much credibility does it really have? That's true. I mean, you, you, you do have a point there. I think here we have a Wasn't quiz. this the same championship that was once defended at WrestleMania in a pillow fight? Was it? I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. Because, I mean, you know, and this is the thing, too, that Wasn't I want... that in WrestleMania 20 or 21 or 22, somewhere around there, Tori Wilson and Sable in a pillow fight? Yeah, I just felt like that was a regular pillow fight, though, because they were SmackDown women, and you have to keep in mind, SmackDown didn't have that championship really okay, involved with the right championship then, for so yeah. long. Um, but I'm See, glad you, you know, brought... You know your, your 2000s and 2010s even history way better than I do. I, I try, my friend. I try. Sometimes it uh, wasn't easy. But uh, I actually... Candace Michelle, the point stands. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, though, regardless, because I did want to bring up this point. As great as this was, and I'm not taking anything away from the segment itself, we got to remember there's still a long way to go because I am happy that there is a championship and there are some quality women on that roster, but you can already see the cracks the following night with what, with what we got, which again, we'll get into that later. Uh, you know, we just need keep getting these signings. We have amazing women still in NXT that I know they need to be developed. I'm not saying call them up to the main roster at once, but when they do get called up, treat them right. You know, I've been hearing about signings, you know, for women, too, that I'm still waiting to see debut. Athena, in particular, has never left my mind. You know, women like that could really make this division special in, you know, like five years' time, maybe even sooner than I'm that. I'm still you know? freaking waiting for Billy Kay and Peyton Royce to get something to do. I know. I know. We have so many quality women down in NXT, and we have a few quality women, you know, on the main roster. And, in fact, some that we actually forget are quality because they don't have crap to do. Uh, Apparently, so you... uh, that... Um... Noof, I don't remember her. Oh, Noof Arabi, maybe? Jasmine yeah. Arabi. I think that her name in NXT is Aaliyah. Yeah. Apparently, she debuted on the very recent set of NXT tapings, and the report that I saw was that she was actually kind of awesome. So, Really? Yeah. See, it jazzes me up to hear that. Like, I want to get excited for these women being a part of the WWE, and I'm already excited for the women as part of NXT, because have you seen it? <laughs> you know, it's just that kind of thing. Uh, I want a great history to be built. For this WWE Women's Championship, and a title's nice, and it can look really beautiful and everything like that, but if there isn't a strong booking behind it, that prestige, the needle of prestige, isn't going to move, you know, in the right direction, so we still need to get our shit together, but I hope we can, because I really love this ceremony. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the main card, though. First match is the Intercontinental Championship ladder match. This was, to me, the second best match on the card. It's just a really good match from beginning to end. Lots of crazy spots. Uh, the one spot I kind of wish they wouldn't have done was Sin Cara Stardust through a ladder. Yeah, dude. Well, one of, I believe, well, I think I, my body only tensed up twice throughout the night. It was that spot. And then, of course, and the Kevin Shane's Owens. Spot. Oh, well, yeah, Ke oh, Kevin Owens made me tense up too, so I should say three times, because two in that match and then the one yeah. spot in the Shane match. Because I remember the one spot where Kevin Owens got uh, exploder suplexed or T-bone suplexed into a ladder. You kind of tensed up on that. Yeah, oh my god, matches like that always, especially in an injury-prone season, uh, a bit very tenseful. But um, yeah, I enjoyed this match. It was a lot of fun. It was what you'd expect in a multi-man ladder match at WrestleMania. It, it was just a moving car wreck, you know? It yeah, was just, and I liked over. how much tension there was towards the end of it, though. Yeah, that was great. Definitely a dramatic finish. Can I say, too, because I don't think... And that's why I can't wait for their individual program, because I know these guys value the little things. I loved that Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn just foregone using ladders altogether and just wanted to beat the hell out of each other personally. Yeah, like, they got, I, these guys cannot exist in a ring at the same time without wanting to just punch each other in the head violently, but relentlessly. Exactly. And I love it, though, because you could have used ladders, but they're like, you know what? Screw that. I, w I want you to know that it's me that's hurting you. I yeah, be well, and plus that. because, I mean, in order for them to use ladders, they would have to go get ladders, and that would take time away from punching each other in the head. Ex exactly. You know, it's just, it's such a great thing, and it's such a small <laughs> thing, but I think it was actually one of the standout moments of the match, as odd as it may be to say. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely a dramatic uh, last few moments. I mean – and here's the thing. Here's where we get to the fun part, right? Because we all know the finish by now. And believe me, if, if nobody else does, I certainly do because everybody was telling me about it. Um, Sami Zayn, I thought he was going to get it. 
because he annihilated Kevin Owens with what I felt like was like a Chimera-esque suplex or something on that ladder. Kevin Owens was just dead. Dead. Climbs it. Miz takes him out. I'm actually thinking Miz is going to get it. And then the moment seen around the world, Zack Ryder shoves him off and he gets it. Now, because this is a more sincere, you know, grounder review, this isn't live reactions. I'm not a fan of Zack Ryder, so that's always true. But I do think he's a good worker. If you've ever heard the praise we give Zack Ryder on NXT, that goes here. You know, the guy can, you know, do his damn job and he can do it well enough, you know, to be in spots like this. I just, I have to agree with what you said in your rant, Ash, and the problem isn't even that Ryder won. He just won so many years late to where anybody, you know, would have cared. And I do yeah. think he got a nice pop. This but... would have been a really, really great moment at WrestleMania 28. Yeah, exactly. You know, a, a stage like that, and, you know, especially because of all the damage you did to his push and his persona, you know, prior to this moment. I mean, my God, if anybody can remember that Kane, John Cena, Eve Torres, Zack Ryder angle, and just all the fallout from that. I mean, Zack looked like a freaking idiot and a joke. And again, the guy's a quality worker. He well, can... and even, I mean, even moving past that, like I said, WrestleMania 28, that was the WrestleMania that Eve kicked him in the balls. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I gotta be serious. But yeah, it, it was kind of funny. But yeah, I mean, you're right. Doesn't do him any favors. And this guy, you know, again, quality worker can fill any spot you put him in. So if you want to reward him something like that, great, because I do think he's a mid-card hand, and that's, you know, kind of his ceiling. The problem is you were late on it. I still think this should have been Sammy's moment, especially after the work he put in at Dallas. I would have given him that Intercontinental title. And, like, he did good, Sammy. You know what, though? I think the fact that he did have that match at Dallas gave you almost like a built-in excuse for why he didn't win tonight. Yeah, that is true. That's an excellent point because he had a war with Shinsuke Nakamura, people. So I could readily buy it. I think what angers me too, Ashton, and again, I don't want to jump the gun because we're going to have everything specifically on Raw later, but it really is disheartening to see the, you know, the game that's being played now with the Intercontinental Championship. But you, you know what? Don't hold back. If you have something that you want to say about WrestleMania that kind of has more clarity because of Raw, bring it up. Yeah, because to me... I mean, look, all joking aside, obviously I'm going to deal with the Ryder title win. Guy can have good matches for the belt. But if you're going to do it, and you're going to do it in a ladder match on a stage like WrestleMania, you could have at least waited till payback for him to drop the damn thing. And it's funny because I'm probably in the minority here because so many people were anticipating, including you and me, so it's not like we were aloof, that he was going to drop it the next night on Raw. But just because you're anticipating it doesn't make it okay. Right. I can anticipate being shot. It doesn't mean that the guy holding the gun has a right to shoot me. You know, if you're going to give it to Zack Ryder, at least have the common decency to just let him have something of a reign and have this on record, people, because it's the only time I'm ever going to defend Zack Ryder if I have any say about it. But let the guy have his freaking moment. You know, you, you and, and see, that's what I don't like. And I noticed this a lot about the WrestleMania because there was one big offender that, oh my God, Ashton, I can't wait to get to it with you. That being a hell in a cell. I don't like taking these journeys. And they did do a little bit of a journey with Zack Ryder because he got in the match. And then they did the sit-down interview with Michael Cole did Kevin Owens. And Zack Ryder was a big topic of conversation, actually. And then Kevin Owens, you know, he kind of denigrated him. Then on a SmackDown, when everybody was having a free-for-all, Zack Ryder was the last man standing. He hit a rough rider on Kevin Owens, and he stood tall. So and he really... beat Chris Jericho on Raw. And he beat Chris Jericho on Raw. Thank you, because I would have glossed over that one, and that's another big one. So this was Zack's story. You told me the story, and you could say, yeah, you finished the story by having him win the championship, but then I almost feel emotionally manipulated and cheated when you take it off of him 24 hours later and you put it on the guy who looked like he was set to win it in the first place in The Miz for a fifth time. I stood correct on live reactions. I thought it was his sixth reign where we were in The Miz's fifth Intercontinental Championship reign. Still insane to think about. But, you know, regardless of my feelings about Zack Ryder, I, I don't like a story to be compromised. And the guy isn't an idiot. You know, he can work. He's worked his ass off. I can recognize that. Give the guy his fucking run, and at least give him a decent program as the champion. A hot potato game isn't a legitimate program, and it's just lazy freaking writing with a guy that if you've seen how he's utilized social media, he could probably carry a feud with another level midcar. Like, if you wanted to do the Miz feud, do the Miz feud, but I don't think that's a really good start. You know, I just, I don't. So, I actually feel you for the guy. You know what, though? It's kind know? of funny if you even look even further than that, because now... 
Zack Ryder is immediately cashing in his rematch clause on SmackDown this week. So if he ends up losing that, then he had this whole run to the top of the world at WrestleMania winning the Intercontinental title to literally not even being in the Intercontinental Championship picture in under a week. Yeah, and you know what angers me, though, dude? Because you're right. That would be horrible if he loses. But to me, though, and I'm, I'm going to sound hypocritical, but let me explain. It's almost as bad if he wins. And it's not because it's Zack Ryder, but because it's lazy writing. Because you're really copy-pasting Kalisto Del Rio with the Intercontinental title. That's all you're doing to me. Because you're trading the title back and forth. And now it's, oh, can Zack Ryder hang on to it? Can he hang on to a dream for once, for fucking once? And that's going to be the question. I think he will, personally, and I do hope he can at least hold it. I would say, if I'm if I'm being honest and I'm being logical, maybe a three to four month run with the Intercontinental title wouldn't hurt. Um, honestly, Did just that kind hurt of for you to say a little bit, you know, yeah, but you know, I I actually, in all honesty, I would love to see him drop it. Even though, honestly, with uh, Sorrow being back in the fold, maybe he'll have bigger plans, but if they want to really kind of build him back up, maybe that would be a fine Intercontinental Champion, but Zack Ryder's a babyface, so I don't know how that would work. I don't know what they're going to do with him. I just don't like him being jerked around. Like, I, I can hate him all day. I'd like to hate him with some consistency. I don't like having to come up here and be like, oh, the guy's getting beat up, because he is! You know, it's, it's not fair what's happening to him, so... Yeah, good match, but I mean, way to neuter your own finish 24 hours later. I mean, well, a little over, but you get my point, so... Yeah. Yeah, a little. Just a little, though, right? Yeah, just just a little. All right, guys, let's move on. Our second match of the night. Was it the women? No, it was definitely not the women. Our second match of the night was Jericho Styles. And this, it's weird because I feel like this is like the forgotten match. Because when I said that Ryback Kalisto was the third or fourth best match of the night, this is the match that was either third or fourth, depending on where you want to rank this versus Ryback Kalisto. Yeah, to me, see, and I don't know if I'm going to get any hate for this, but I'm always honest with you guys. I like this match. I felt like those guys went in and they put in the work. But one, and I'm not going to stop saying it because it held true here, fourth matchup. So already I think that was a strike against it before the bell even rang. And two, and I've said this. Now, I haven't seen it much in, in ROH, you know, recently, but I remember like old school ROH, I always used to say I would hate the near falls after a ridiculous move would happen that I felt like should have been a match ender. The idea that Chris Jericho could kick out of both a springboard 450 and a Styles Clash, you know, just seemed ridiculous to me. Well, and, and especially, too, because he lost to the Styles Clash the following night on Raw. Exactly. So you kicked out of it at Mania, especially when that was preceded by, it seemed like, a shit ton of stuff. And yet you get pinned by it on Raw. Guess Raw just wasn't your night then, huh, Chris? And, you know, I mean, sure, the finish with just, oh, I, I caught him. It was like a catch code breaker because he intercepted AJ in the air. That would have been cool if you didn't already have, like, all those false finishes that I'm sorry, Ashton, for me, and I can't speak for you, but I'm assuming you feel at least somewhat the same way. Take me out of the match because I'm like, okay, okay. It's one thing to go through a move set. How about you actually, you know, tell a story here? And I just really couldn't get into it all that much. Like, I get these guys were trying to one-up each other, and it was a game of who really is the best, and Jericho's insecure. But, you know, it, it just seemed like it got a little bit much. I feel, I feel like you could have shaved a few minutes off this. I would have had AJ win with the Styles Clash. And that's another thing. I would have had AJ win, period. You know, but Jericho went over, uh, which is even more hilarious, given that now we are looking at AJ Styles as a number one contender. So a guy that lost a WrestleMania match the night prior totally bounces back and he's a number one contender for the world title. Now I dude, like AJ. that's actually happened four years in a row now. Really? Yeah, dude. I, I actually saw, um, this was the fourth year in a row that the person who lost the second match at WrestleMania went on to compete for the title in the following pay-per-view. Wow. You know what? That's going to make me start paying attention to uh, either the second match or a match that would seem like it would have viable contenders, you know, yeah. starting next year. Because Yeah, dude, because next uh, year, or, uh, WrestleMania 29, uh, the second match uh, was Mark Henry versus Ryback. And Mark Henry won, and then you remember Ryback hit the shell shock after the match, and we were all angry. But then the following night on Raw, Ryback turned heel and challenged Cena for the title. Right. Uh, WrestleMania 30... The second match was 
Um, I believe the pre-show, the second match, I th- think the second match was the Shield versus the New Age Outlaws and Kane. And Kane ended up challenging Brian for the belt at the following pay-per-view. Right, right. And then uh, last year, the second match was Randy Orton beating Seth Rollins. And obviously, Rollins went into the following pay-per-view as the champion because of the cash-in. Right. And now the second match on this show was Jericho Styles and Styles lost. And now he's going to be challenging for the title at the next pay-per-view. Four years in a row, dude. Yeah, so, and only one of those years, the winner of the second match, which is actually a logical one, Orton, uh, you know, would go on a challenge, but the other three were losers, and, you know, AJ fits into that latter category. He lost to Jericho, which, I mean, yeah, like, what does that really say? I Again, I like AJ, I think he's one hell of a performer, but you've got to have some booking common sense. Everybody falls victim to it. It doesn't matter if I like a guy or not. It would have been the same problem as much as I would have marked out. If Kevin Owens would have won that fatal four-way, you know, I would have had to say the same thing if we're being objective and we're looking at things critically. Doesn't make the best sense when you were a loser last night. At least his excuse was, I'm dropping a championship, so I'm going to elevate myself now. But AJ didn't have that to fall back on. Uh, You know, and I mean, again, I'm happy for him. I mean, I'm very intrigued by the program, but you didn't beat Jericho, but then you pin him on Ryan again. And that's another thing, too. This show, I feel like, at least with these two matches, you know, the ladder match, actually, and the Usos Dudley, there was a lot of 50-50 booking between the WrestleMania and the Raw. And and, and it's just, and that was a problem that we did in our top 10 list. Go and check that out. The top 10 things that uh, WWE needs to change. Uh, it was the 50-50 booking, and you saw a lot of that within these two shows. So, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed Jericho Styles, but I felt like there were too many false finishes. The outcome boggled my mind. And then the big talking point that I know you brought up, Ashton, it seemed like they were going to try and establish a phenomenal forearm because that was the only move he didn't hit. So, 450 kick out, Styles Clash kick out. That forearm, though? Ridiculous. And then the following night, he didn't use the forearm at all, and he ended up winning because of the Styles Clash. Just make up your mind, WWE. Make up your mind. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, up next, let's move on. Um, after Styles Jericho, we had the New Day versus the League of Nations, which League of Nations won. I don't know why. I, I guess, I, I mean, honestly, Wade Barrett wasn't even in the match, so it was three on three. Um... And I guess maybe that you could argue that the whole idea was let's see how we can do without Barrett. And then the following night they had Barrett and they lost and that's why they exiled him. See, but that doesn't make any sense either. Like I get what you're saying, right? But if you remember the only reason Seamus was able to hit that bro kick on Xavier Woods was because Xavier ate a bull hammer. Yeah. Barrett got involved. Now, yep. A lot of people are speculating, oh, does that mean Barrett's turning face? It uh, doesn't matter what Barrett's turning, because he's turning a corner. He's See, that's gone. where that's where you have to throw kayfabe logic out the window, almost, because realistically, the only reason the League of Nations won, and this is a little bit more on the inside, uh, the League of Nations won because the WWE wanted an excuse to bring out Austin and Foley and Michaels, but they couldn't have it be a run-in because of how out of shape Mick Foley is. He wouldn't have been able to literally run in. Right. So that's why the League of Nations won, so that they could do the promo afterwards, and then we could have the slow entrances, and then have the three guys kind of slowly make their way down the ring. Whereas if the New Day would have won, the only way to get those guys out there is if the League of Nations would have started beating them down, and then you would have had to do run-ins, where you had those three guys come out, run down to the ring, and make the save. And it wouldn't have worked with Foley, because he wouldn't have been able to really run. Exactly. Which, I don't know, like, it, it's a legitimate excuse, if not incredibly loose, you know, from where I sit. So, because we had to... To me, I like, guess to me, though, like, why couldn't that have been The Rock instead of Mick Foley? And then you could do the run-in, and then later on in the night, who's interacting with the Wyatt family? Mick freaking Foley. Exactly, yeah. Perfect switcher. And, and the thing about The Rock, too, I mean, I'll just say this now, you could have shaved off so much time from that segment yeah. and, and, and just given it elsewhere. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, And especially because Foley, I mean, like it was really cool to see him, but he's always been more of a talker than a like, you know, an in-ring kind of like exciting, crazy, 
you know, worker or anything like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's an amazing in-ring talent. I'm not trying to take anything away from him there. But right. what's, what made Mick Foley legendary, I mean, obviously the, the risks that he was willing to take, but then secondary to that is his talking, his promos. And he didn't talk at all tonight. All he did was pull out Mr. Sacco and deliver a few, you know, few second long mandible claws. Like, I feel like that really wasn't the best use of him. No, I, I have to agree with you in hindsight. Having looked at WrestleMania for what it was, I think, especially given uh, the Wyatt's following actions, which I think makes the League of Nations winning make a bit more sense because the Wyatt family have gunned for them. So I guess, I, I mean, we'll, we'll get into the Wyatt family because there's stuff that I want to ask you about that later. But I think given their turn, maybe it would have made more sense if Foley gave them the motivation or the inspiration, or whatever word you want to use, because Foley could have said, you know, you've got all this talent, you've got all this ability, and knowing Foley, though, he could have taken it a step further and really put these guys over. And I'm saying Rock didn't try, yeah. but it didn't get, take long for The Rock to devolve into his usual shtick, you know? So I feel like Foley would have definitely helped the cause a lot more than The Rock did. I guess maybe they were going for the WrestleMania record, and Mick Foley wouldn't have been able to finish a match in six seconds like The Rock did. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And, um, you know, so I guess talk about what the Y family should have been doing at the show regardless. Oh, my God. Yeah, we have I think Y family are going to be a big topic of conversation, actually, between these two shows. But, yeah, as far as this match goes, not bad. You know, I mean, again, just another question will finish that I guess made more sense when you look at the context of the following night on Raw. But we didn't have it then. And it just seemed like the New Day were on a roll. And I guess also because the titles weren't on the line. That's another excuse for League of Nations to win. Yeah. But, eh, you know, it, it was a good match, but, eh, you the, know, it was whatever. The, the advertising for this match was a complete mess, too, because at first it looked like it was going to be two on two. And then we found out, oh, no, it's going to be four on three for the titles. And then we thought, oh, no, it's non-title, so it's just going to be four on three without the titles. But then Barrett wasn't in the match, so it really was just a normal six-man tag team match. Right. It was right. so dumb. The, there was Wait. a lot of – there. That, this wasn't the first time something like that happened tonight either. I will say, I mean, and I don't mean this to be a slap in the face, but I don't know how else it's supposed to come off. I mean, the best part of this match to me was New Day's entrance. New Day's oh entrance God, kicked yes. ass. Coming out insane gear. Oh, my God. My the inner big box nerd. of bootios. Yeah, they came out of the cereal box, the box of bootios, and in that Saiyan gear, my inner nerd was just so freaking happy. Like, I'm a big DBZ fan. Freaking love it. I know you enjoy DBZ, too. You're a fan of it as well. So that was a great nod. I, I love it. I'm one of the few people on the planet that actually likes GT, too. Exa yeah, you you definitely are in the minority there, brother. But I commend you, actually, for finding <laughs> good points about it. Uh, but, yeah, I love Xavier Woods. You know, I love – because I, I can tell you he probably spearheaded this. I mean, maybe Big E and Kobe were like, oh, yeah, we like it, too. But you know that was probably 85% at least Xavier, if not in the 90s, because – yeah, he is all about that life, and I love him for it. So, great WrestleMania entrance. I, you know, and that that's, I'd say, yeah, I'd say I think Sasha Banks kind of topped him in the end with what she had going on. We'll talk about that. But, man, Xavier brought it with that saying gear, man. And so the great Triple stuff. H topped him out at the end of the night. Oh, my God, that too. Oh, my God, we had so much to talk about yet. So, yeah, you want to move on? Up next was Brock Lesnar versus Dean Ambrose in what was easily the most disappointing match of the night by a mile. That size should have just been my review by itself. Um, Do we want to move on? Um, I honestly, I, I just want to say this: underwhelming doesn't even begin to cover it. I, I had such and it was high made hopes. even worse too by the fact that we didn't get Dean or Brock the following night on Raw. I know. Like I was hope. Oh well, Brock Lesnar beat Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose was just in contention for the title. Logically, Brock is the number one contender, right? But no, Brock doesn't show up enough to be number one contender. <laughs> that really is what it comes down to. That guy could probably demolish Ric Flair's record if he just showed up to work more. Because he would either be in contendership matches or world title matches just interchangeably. Yeah. Just like, you know, pick one. Um, yeah, dude. I mean, and I just have to say, because you, you uh, more than anybody else, you knew how much I was anticipating this match and how much I was looking forward to it. Yeah, this I was even, your most anticipated match of the entire night. Yeah, and you know... And I, I think even, a lot it, of people said that. It wasn't just you. Mm hmm. I definitely wasn't alone. Yeah, a lot of people, I think, were anticipating this. And the thing is, I was anticipating it so much. I even felt like I gave it a pass on a few issues because I remember even physically saying like, oh, yeah, this is bad, but I'll give it a pass because these guys are going to do something so great. They didn't do shit. 
Nope. You know, and it's really it's really underwhelming to and well not underwhelming is the word, it really aggravates me because you could say, well, maybe they kept it tame because Hell in a Cell is gonna blow our minds, or Triple H and Roman Reigns, it was supposed to be no DQ, that may blow our minds too. Nope. On both counts. I felt like all three matches, well, two, and then one that I thought was advertised to be violent, but then they redacted that, really under-delivered with the stipulation. Now, I don't know if it's... I love, too, that we had all this blood leading up to WrestleMania, you know, with Roman bleeding, and Triple H was bloody at one point, and The Undertaker bled on the one show, and then we get to WrestleMania, and throughout the entire show, not a single drop of blood was shed. Makes no sense to me, dude. None. No sense. I'm like, what is going on here? The two biggest weapons, if I remember correctly, from the no-holds-barred street fight were a steel chair and a a kendo stick. stick. Yeah. Because the chainsaw was exactly what we thought it was going to be. Because I even said... It was was Chekhov's chainsaw. It was the check saw. Just the check saw. Exactly. I mean, and I think I even said at one point, I mean, you were saying, you know, check saw the entire time. So, I mean, kudos to you. But even I remember saying at one point, they're only going to have that to get the Heyman reaction because Heyman's reaction faces are gold. I mean, did you see the streak ending? You know, that face was classic. Um, so, yeah, that didn't get used, which I didn't expect it to. I mean, what are they going to do? Saw Brock Lesnar's arm off? I don't think so. But and again, again, the biggest booking problem. I mean, fine. You you underutilize your stipulation, whatever. One hit Dean Ambrose. Again. Again. One F5. Now, I know a lot of people probably say it was on a pile of steel chairs. I get that. But you couldn't have made Dean seem more formidable leading up to it. The biggest thing he got off was dirty deeds on those same chairs. Which, I mean, by the way, this establishes F5. Yeah, a hell of a lot stronger than dirty deeds, apparently. Yeah. Um, and, and Dean, I love the guy, and I feel like, man, there is a great baby face there, but how now? How now? Like, it's going to take so much time to rehabilitate him, and I do think he can be rehabilitated. I'm not that hopeless. But you have to give a shit first. This guy looks like nothing. Dean, who should be one of the toughest people on the roster, easily, easily, with his gimmick, his persona, where he grew up, like, telling his story— a CCW, for God's sakes, which they openly acknowledged in that video with him training in the desert. And he's one hit Dean Ambrose. Glass jaw. I mean, th- this really is a glass jaw kind of guy. And I don't want to say it because it's not me saying it maliciously. If anything, I'm sad as a motherfucker saying it because Dean should be running away with this. But no, we got to make Roman Reigns the tough guy. Makes no sense to me. This match disappointed me so much that if that Hell in a Cell wasn't a thing, I would be far angrier at this match. And I, I think that's the only thing making me pull back. But yeah, major, major disappointment. And Dean Ambrose, who's going to care now? I, I don't know. Because especially now, when Seth Rollins and other guys make their returns, to me, I don't know if Dean has the momentum now, and he certainly doesn't have the booking to stay relevant and to stay cared about in the people's minds. I just yeah. don't believe it. I mean, do you disagree with me at all? I mean, oh, absolutely you- not. No, dude, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm buying everything you're selling. Then, I mean, we're agreed. I really have nothing else. I, Dean Ambrose got screwed. And by extension, Dean Ambrose fans, because I was enjoying the rise as much as everybody else. It's over. I mean, pack your bags, people. It's done. Let's just move on to the next one, because Dean's fucked. I, I don't know what you do after that. Yeah. All right. Up next was the women's triple threat match of the night. By far, I would even say. Uh, and really, the only, the only negative that I can honestly say about this match was that Charlotte retained. And that's it. And yeah. you know what? Okay. Not just the way, not just that Charlotte retained, but also the way that Charlotte retained. And I was getting ready to say, I could even give the fact that Charlotte retained a pass the way she retained, though, rubbed me the wrong way. First and foremost, though, I want you to kind of break this match down because I feel like I've been talking a lot and this was the match of the night. So I want you to really tell me what you really enjoyed from top to bottom about this match. What were some of your favorite moments? I personally, dude, I just love that these women go out there with the goal of convincing the audience that they want to win the match. It is such a simple thing to try and do in wrestling. And yet when you see guys like Dolph Ziggler or The Miz or Zack Ryder, they go in there and it's so much clearer that their goal is to entertain first. Yes. Women with these women. 
it is so abundantly clear that they are so freaking hungry to win this match. And all it really comes down to is that they're just that good at working because that's what it is. They are working the crowd into believing that they want to win because they already know who's winning going into the match. So it's not like that's an actual competition. Like, Oh, we need to win. We need to win. They're just that good at getting us to suspend our disbelief. And that I think is something that a lot of the men could learn from. Oh my goodness. Yes. You want to know something funny because I know you've heard the same interviews that I have. People like Sasha and Charlotte have said their goal is to main event a WrestleMania. They could have easily main evented this one. The only tweak I would have made is I would have had a baby face go over because that's, I feel like it should be a tradition. WrestleMania a tradition that WWE in their minds thought they were upholding. The audience vehemently disagreed, but we'll get to that. Uh, you know, this match could have easily main evented with the quality of this card, man. And that's the thing, like, this this card could have even been excellent. I still feel like the women would have given them a run for their money. That's just how good they are. Um, I freaking loved it. I mean, just starting with entrances, Sasha's I loved. Sasha had the best attire and the best entrance. I love that Snoop was a part of it. So you have that familial connection. The Eddie Guerrero, uh, Guerrero tribute honestly hit me kind of hard because you and I know that story very well. And, you know, what she did in the match, her frog splash was a thing of beauty. Her shimmy was adorable. Like, she was into it. She was having fun. Charlotte, you know, I kind of feel bad because I, I know on live reactions I was poking fun at her achieving her quote-unquote final form of being Ric Flair 2.0, having her own robe. But apparently that robe was made from pieces of the robe that Flair wore at WrestleMania 24, his retirement match against Shawn Michaels. So I'll give it a nod. That's pretty freaking cool. Becky... I liked uh, her attire, too. She seemed to have, like, kind of like a, you know, she calls herself the last kicker, kind of like a warrior look a little bit to her. I think you even said she had, like, a feather in her hair or something. So, aesthetically, like, all three attires were badass. Freaking love that. And then you get to the match. I thought the pacing was great. I thought they had a lot of great moments. Uh, Again, Sasha's frog splash. Excellent. The Bex Plex from the top rope. You know, that was excellent. Charlotte's moonsault, which surprisingly a lot of people have called the spot of the match. I disagree. I feel like Sasha had the You know why, match. though? It's because of the the sort of the way that it was framed almost because they really did a good job of making sure that all eyes were on Charlotte. And she's like a really, really tall in general when you compare her to the rest of the women on the roster. She's she's in that like Alicia Fox Summer Ray range as far as height goes. Uh, and for her to be able to do a moonsault, and not only a moonsault, but to the outside, they really kind of build that up as, like, an amazing feat of athleticism. And plus, you had, like, this Amazonian woman jumping onto these two smaller women, and it made it seem like a bigger deal. Right, right. Like, the whole idea there is, like, that that one spot is going to be shown on WrestleMania video packages for decades to come. Oh, my God, yeah. See, that's how Charlotte got her WrestleMania moment. Because you know they're going to use that as, like, stock footage in all their subsequent video packages. I completely agree. Uh, Sasha's dive through the ropes into that kind of, like, Zenton-esque maneuver. Oh, my God, that was nuts. Beautiful. I have never seen anything like that. Just to transit. And here's the thing. It wasn't even, like, a mid-move transition because, I mean, that would still be impressive as fuck. But we've seen stuff like that. This seemed like a split second. Like, oh, shit, am I losing control? Let me turn it into something else. And she does. Like, when people say that Sasha Banks is the best wrestler in the world right now, I mean, I know I always give a shout-out to A.V. Coles Latoya Ferguson, who, you know, I know she really seems to hate this WrestleMania as much as everybody else. Uh, you know, she's often said, like, I can't say that about Sami Zayn anymore because Sasha Banks is a thing. This is the reason why. She wrestles out of her goddamn mind every single time. Yeah. And honestly, I'm not even saying this from a fan perspective. From a booking perspective, I, I have to say, I think I think uh, Sasha should have won. And again, and let's get to that, Ric Flair gets involved. Because earlier on in the match, you have Becky Lynch take out Flair, which I thought was cool. And honestly, I knew it wouldn't have because he's Ric Flair. And even as old as he is, you know, I guess it wasn't going to keep him down. I would have negated him for the rest of the match. No, he was able to recover and do his thing and keep Sasha at bay while Charlotte had the figure eight on Becky and Becky taps out. So again, Ric Flair gets involved, 
and I don't want to take the piss out of this match because you guys were so close to hitting a home run. But again, it wasn't even the performers, the fucking booking. Because of course you choose that finish. Because of course we haven't seen it at every major television show or event leading up to this show. And Rick because Lerning of course you can't crown a new women's champion without the influence of a man. Yeah, and you've been saying that a lot, and I'm glad you said it again here for this review, because I do think that's hilarious. A man makes the difference in a match that should have been all about the women. I would have given this match even higher praise if that spot where Rick got taken out, that's where they wrote him out of the match. Because I would have been like, great, not only did you feed him a comeuppance, but then you really made it come down to the three women. And you can't even say that they did either, because Flair still got involved, so how did he eat a comeuppance if he was still able to do the stuff that he's been doing? You know, like nothing really developed. And then given what we got the following night with the ceremony and knowing that both Sasha and Becky are kind of out of the picture, which is hilarious if you're a Sasha fan because she wasn't even part of the decision and it was her first, only her first championship opportunity. I I mean, I don't even understand it, but this is a quality matchup. I love the championship as far as matches go. Not a bad match for that title to start out on. But the freaking booking, man, they have got to get that shit in order because there was so much head-scratching stuff and stuff that made you face palm, and this was yet another case to me. I mean, why again? The, the, he just needs to get the shit beat out of him before the match even starts. Is Now I'm convinced, you know, because otherwise what's going to happen? Or an authority figure, because maybe now it'll it'll be Shane or whatever, uh, needs to step in and be like, oh, for this match, Rick, you're banned from ringside because how else is this going to change? Or they just need to have a valet or a manager with them at ringside to actually get him away. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I think the Schleg Daddy was pushing so hard for Snoop to also be at ringside. It was exciting when Snoop comes out for the uh, for the, the entrance for the performance, but then he walks Sasha to the ring like halfway down the ramp and then just kind of like, all right, have fun, bye. And in the meantime, then... Charlotte's just sitting backstage like, oh, 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 there goes your chances, ladies. Exactly. And especially Sasha. And that's why I'm glad you used the Snoop example, because she was the one that got screwed because Flair restrained her yep. while Becky tapped out. Exactly. So if Snoop was there, he could have pulled a Trump at least and tackled Ric Flair and did his best work punches that he could and just be like, OK, Sasha, it's all you, girl. And then she could have won the match. Oh, my God. I mean, I could have seen, like, a really simple spot where, like, Snoop gets up in Rick's face and maybe, like, shoves him down to the ground, and then Rick goes to throw a punch, Snoop blocks it and hits him with, like, a freaking judo toss or something. You know what I mean? Right, right. Something really simple like that, and then he, like, taunts him, like, yeah, you stay down, or something like that, and then he goes back to watching the match, and Ric Flair just stays down. Right, right. I don't know. I, maybe he wouldn't want to be made to look weak by a celebrity because, you know, Ric Flair has the biggest ego on the planet. Well, you know, he needs to learn to take a bruising onset ego because this shit's getting ridiculous. Did like you know, every time Ric Flair enters a room that Vince McMahon was in, Vince is forced to leave because their egos just don't fit. I know. It's ridiculous. They're just both so huge. All right. Do you, uh, you have anything else you want to say about this match? Um... I'm trying to think of any uh, any additional comments, but I think I'm about out. All right, we can move on. Okay, up next we had the Hell in a Cell match, and the match was really, really pointless and really meaningless, and the only reason that we were invested was because of the stipulations, and even then, the stipulation that we thought was the most logical one to happen ended up not happening, and then it got completely canceled out by the following night. So, as far as matches go, bottom three. As far as results go, worse than the worst. Yeah. And, I mean, Ashton, you, you articulated everything perfectly. I mean, not only will I co-sign on to everything you just said, because I, I think you just hit it point by point, the worst thing was the finish because as far as an in-ring product goes, you know it's going to be anywhere from average to just below average. You have to go in with that expectation. These are older guys. Shane isn't known to be a consistent worker. He's only done like a few matches, and it's all been built around what can I jump off of? I mean, yeah, literally. And, and that's the thing, too, is like if you look at Shane McMahon's match history, what's the best match Shane McMahon's ever had, John? Uh, wasn't it that last man standing match against Big Show where he jumped off that huge thing at SummerSlam or not, not well, SummerSlam, whatever it was. I, I would personally argue that the best match he's ever had was the match he had with Kurt. 
Oh, King of the Ring. You're right. You're right. Because I remember the highlights in that match. Yeah, King of the Ring with Kurt Angle. And they did a bunch and, of crazy stuff in that match. Well, and, and even then, think about that. Shane McMahon's best match ever is against whom? Uh, somebody that could put on a match of the year with a broomstick. Exactly. Exactly. You know, Shane is a guy, and I don't fault him for it, but you need to give him a quality worker if you're going to put him in there with somebody. And Undertaker and, is a quality worker, but not for this kind of match. Yeah, not for this kind of match. The Undertaker it, is a quality worker if you're going to put him against some chipper, like, you know, young, up-and-comer, scrappy guy. Like, And I shouldn't even need to necessarily say young, up-and-comer. If you put Taker against someone who is like an underdog, scrappy fighter who can fight from beneath, a la Shawn Michaels, perfect. If you can put The Undertaker against someone who can match his physicality, a la Triple H. Did I say Triple H before I meant Shawn Michaels? I think you said Shawn Michaels. You're good. You're good. Okay, well, a la Triple H, as I was saying, perfect. If you can put Undertaker against another giant so you can have like a Clash of the Titans, that works too. But what doesn't work is when you put him with a non-wrestler. Right. And yeah, I just, I, I don't know, dude. Like to me, from an in-ring perspective, this match was meh. I mean, just straight up bad. I was bored through most of it, but I could have forgiven all that. If the journey you took me on, you took me to the destination that you seem to be promising me. It was all about Shane Winning. And then what pisses me off even more, because I, I said it about the ladder match. I've got to say it here because this is the biggest offender. The next night, Vince just gives him the keys anyway. Well, I got the log box and I got nothing better to do. All right, Shane, have at it. No, fuck you, man. Like, why do that to me? Why do this whole story if literally, literally the next night on Raw, the first thing you do, you know what? You did good. And I don't want to be a sore winner. Have the keys anyway. Why? Why? Why even bother with this whole thing? And see, now I'm getting angry all over again. Because well, no, John, one see, thing. here's my thing. Um, just, just to, I know that this is, we're trying to maintain a little bit of structure, but I think that this is the kind of structure that kind of allows for a little bit of jumping around. Right. The Wyatt family on Raw, the Wyatt family turned face and attacked the League of Nations, right? Right. Shane McMahon was given the keys to the kingdom on Raw, right? Right. Why did not the Wyatt family help Shane McMahon beat The Undertaker? You would have had the exact same things going on by the end of the night on Raw. It would have just given us a less cheap experience and a much more exciting experience even at WrestleMania, which is supposed to be your biggest and or best show of the year. I completely agree. I mean, you're not wrong. And plus, it still would have made sense because the Wyatt family have, have that history with The Undertaker. Exactly. And, and they would have hated him for the moment, but then as soon as they attacked people that got legitimately booed in that arena... And then the you, could have, you could have even had them still attack the League of Nations the following night, and that would have cemented the face turn, and then people wouldn't have been so freaked out, like, why the hell is this happening who do I cheer? Or am I supposed to be cheering for the Wyatt family now? No, you would have known then because they helped Shane McMahon win. And I have to say this too, and again, not to be all scattered all over the place, but this is another point of criticism. Shane McMahon, as what I'm going to say WWE thought was the clearly defined babyface because he was the one promising change and not perpetuating stagnation, looked like a complete idiot. And we said this a lot in live reactions. You're a McMahon, and if there's one thing when I grew up and, right. and the McMahons were on my TV – Always have an ace in the hole. I remember Survivor Series 2001 when it was the Alliance versus the WWF. Uh, Vince was having a backstage segment with Linda, and Linda was like, well, Vince, you know, don't you think Shane and Stephanie, can we just work this out? She was worried about the kids. And, like, are, are you worried about us, the company? And he pretty much said, Linda, I, I'm a man of calculated risks, and I've taken a calculated risk. More or less, I have an ace in the hole tonight. And, of course, Kurt Angle defected at the last second. You know, that was that old finish. So McMahon's always have a plan. Always, it seems like. Shane's plan, jump off stuff. That's it. I mean, with all the change you're promising, wouldn't it make sense? Again, to really just emphasize Ashton's point, you could go to the Wyatts and be like, hey, man, you have got all the ability in the world. Kind of say what The Rock was saying, you know, before, again, he went into the shtick. But you've never really been given the opportunity because for the authority, it's always been about them. I get this, man. Guys like you get to rise. You get to spread your message. You get to take down the machine tonight. And then they come out and they do it. Like, you couldn't influence anybody. You couldn't have anybody in your back pocket. No, literally, you literally put all of your eggs in a leap of faith. 
which by the way, your sons were watching because they were part of your entrance. So that promo that Vince cut was, oh, you know, your sons, they'll only know you as a failure, but at least in me, they'll have a father figure. Wasn't that kind of validated when not only did Shane lose, but it was up to Vince to take pity on him and give him the keys the next night later? Like, if I'm his sons, I'm thinking, oh, well, Vince really is a nice guy. We should be looking up to him. Like, none of this worked at all, and that's why I'm angry about it, because it's one thing to have a bad match, and you could forgive that. It's another thing to have a bad story, and I'm far less forgiving about that, and this was just a bad story. There was so much confusion, and the one destination we thought we were going to go, we didn't fucking go there. Only at the last second, oh wait, yes we did, but in a way that was far more underwhelming than what we could have done. Way to screw the pooch, WWE. You have anything else you want to say? Yeah, you have anything else you want to say, brother? Because I'm, yeah, I'm done this rant. Yeah, yeah, I'm... It's, man, this entire match was not good. And that's the thing, too. Like, even if Shane would have won, which would have made the story feel less cheap, like I said earlier, the match still wasn't good. The entire match was predicated on The Undertaker beats Shane up, Shane ducks one punch, and then does some stuff to The Undertaker. Lather, rinse, rinse, repeat. That's it. That's all it was. It was... It was such a paint-by-numbers match, and there are people actually saying that this would have been a good match if Shane would have won, and I completely disagree. I don't think this was a good match regardless of the story even, and I'm a story sucker. I love a good story in wrestling. That's why I love Lucha Underground so much. But even if the story would have been better to close this match out, it still wasn't a good match. And even then, even then, if you were talking about the story being better to close the match... There was still, I, I said this during live reactions, one of these guys had no motivation to fight and credibility, and the other guy had no credibility but all the motivation to fight. So why should I care about this match? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think it says a lot for a guy like you to say, because I know that you're a story-driven kind of personality when it comes to your wrestling, that even if they would have logically finished the story they set out to tell when Shane went over, that doesn't completely absolve it from being a bad match. It just shows you how bad this was. And I do agree. You're not wrong. I just think I'd be far less angry. I'd still be angry, but not to the degree that I am, that not only do you have a bad match, which I kind of anticipated given the workers, and I think you did too, and I'm hoping at least most people did. I don't know. It actually kind of surprised me how people I think were anticipating this to be a show steal or at least a good match or whatever, but you don't even take us to the destination, or at least not in the way that would have made the most sense and would have just been the you know least rage-inducing. God, this match, man, I can't wait to put it behind me. <sighs> so anything else well, you want to say? Well, let's put it behind us then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, up next, we had our Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, which was Nightmare. It, it, this match was pretty much the antithesis of the women's match because this match was nightmarish until the very end, and then the winner was awesome, whereas the women's match was the exact opposite. Oh, my God. You wasted a uh, battle royal spot on Shaquille O'Neal. I don't... And, I mean, people were saying that this was a good thing, but to me, still, you wasted battle royal spots on DDP and Tatanka. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, guys, look... I know there are DDP fans and there are even Tatanka fans. Again, I understand that. I used to be one myself when he had a brief SmackDown run. Um, you know, but I mean, really, with all the talent that isn't injured and would kill to be on WrestleMania, you opt for those two guys? Come on now, man. Like, they're going to get the WrestleMania beta and then you're never going to see him again. You know, I don't think you're going to see Tatanka again anytime soon. DDP, maybe, but I highly doubt that too. And there are so many guys that you could have put in there that you didn't. Uh, I don't get it. And But you're absolutely right, though, Ashton, because then we get to the finish. Baron Corbin last eliminating Kane. I thought that was freaking awesome. Yeah. Especially because, you know, when Hideo did it, I believe Hideo's year was last year, he got eliminated re uh, relatively early. But the idea that both an NXT guy was in the Battle Royal and then he won it, which was kind of... And not yeah. only did he win it, but this actually ended up being Baron's official call-up, too, because then he was on Raw, too. Yeah, so his main roster debut was synonymous with his WrestleMania debut. You know, they were one and the same, and he won. Like, that's amazing. His and debut th match was him winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. That is awesome. That, yeah, it is awesome. 
That is awesome. And I'll tell you something. It could mean a hell of a lot more if they book him right now. As far as his Raw debut, we'll probably get more into a substantive discussion about that later. But I didn't think it was bad. I'd still say this is a nice start. I don't think they've killed Baron Corbin right out of the gate. I'm just hoping they can handle him well because to me, and I said this very early on, you know, when he debuted on NXT, I feel like he shares that same quality as Brock Lesnar in the sense that I think this guy can be such a badass as to ascend to the level of an attraction. I think Baron Corbin can be an attraction, and I feel like him winning something like the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, not saying it's the most credible thing, but him winning it on his first night really does that service. Like, oh man, you know, who is this guy? He eliminated Kane, you know, he dominated, he did all this stuff. So, yeah, great booking decision there. Horrible match, but great finish. So, congrats to Baron Corbin. Like I said, the exact opposite of the women's match. Yeah, I mean, that's really the best way to describe it. All right, so up next we had the Rock segment, and his sole purpose uh, prior to the Wyatt family coming out was to announce that they had broken the attendance record, which they legitimately did, actually. I actually found out on the uh, the Wrestling Observer the following night from Meltzer they legitimately did break their own WrestleMania attendance record. They actually had a little bit under 94,000 people in that arena. Okay. Okay. So, you know, at least they broke it, but it just wasn't 101,000. So they did inflate it a little bit. Whatever. It's WWE. I'm sure they inflate a lot and embellish a lot. To well, make themselves look I mean, they, they've been embellishing the WrestleMania 3 number for decades now. So Right, right. They really only had like 75,000 people in there. But I mean, that's still a lot, but... It's just funny that like the iconic number is 93,000 and it was really 75. Right, right. So uh, so then, of course, the Wyatt family comes out. The Rock puts over Bray Wyatt's charisma and all that stuff while simultaneously calling Eric Rowan inbred, saying that – what did he say about Braun Strowman? Uh, didn't he say like your – no, he said about Rowan that your parents were related. That's what and I said, then, that he was inbred. Which, yeah, which Strowman – I forget what the insult to Strowman was, honestly. So, I mean, yeah, but he pretty much was saying, yeah, you guys really are backwoods and this and that. And then to Bray, he made a fat joke about how he does is just inhale, you know, hot pockets and stuff like that. So Rock was kind of talking out of both sides of his ass because, oh, you've got all this ability, but let me make fun of you anyway, which, again, I can't entirely fault the Rock because if he didn't do it, he wouldn't be the Rock. But this is precisely why when you said earlier, Mick Foley would have been better for the role. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's so funny, too, because there was a thing on Reddit where someone was like, you know, I bet you that The Rock spent the last six months telling the WWE he wanted to work with Rowan. And they were just convinced that he meant Roman and went with it until the final day when he actually said Rowan. And they were like, no, you mean Roman. And he said, no, I do mean Roman. And then we ended up having a match between The Rock and Rowan and The Rock won in six seconds. Right. Which, you know what? I mean, here's the thing. Eric Rowan had no credibility anyway, so that doesn't even bother me. Right. I'm a little bit salty at the idea that, like, that kind of, like, hurt Bray Wyatt by association, but Eric Rowan losing a match in six seconds is whatever. But you know what? Like, I've I've marinated on it, and, like, yeah, this – then we use the phrase a lot, right, building up to this, and I guess we use the phrase actually discussing it. In a vacuum, this would have pissed me off. Honestly, in a Raw, you know, given what happened on Raw the following night – Maybe this is a good thing because we already talked about how they attacked the League of Asians, so it's no surprise. And I honestly thought when I was watching that back and seeing the crowd into it, I thought about the um, quote that Seth Rollins put out when he first got injured. Only when we lose everything are we free to do anything. And I feel like the Wyatts have lost everything, dude. Like they have nothing left. So if this is their rebuild as baby faces, maybe this is the time. I doubt it. Because I've had hope like this before, and I've been screwed over and hurt a thousand times, so this is probably going to be a thousand and one. But at least now they've turned the page. They're going to be baby faces. Let's see where they go with it. Because as far as I'm concerned, they literally and metaphorically hit rock bottom last night. Nothing else they could lose. Maybe now this is them crawling out of the hole and back into the sunlight. So... We'll see what happens. I'm actually looking forward to it, but man, if this was any indication, I have no fucking reason to hope because WWE just views these guys as a bunch of jokes. Although I will say, not going to put my salt towards this man, it was actually good to see John Cena come out. You know, yeah, he helped The Rock and whatever, but, you know, I heard he's going to be coming back. You were telling me what, Ashton, like June, July? Hey, I, like- I heard. 
you heard May. Wouldn't surprise me, May. The guy's still a freak. So it'll be good to see him. I don't know what exactly they'll have him do. He'll be back in time, though, for SummerSlam, so they'll probably give him a big summer program for a SummerSlam match. Um, but, yeah, you know, not bad. Good to see him. Just a shame that, again, it had to be at the Y family's expense. And, again, I have to say, funny that they only got a segment this year when the prior two years at least Bray Wyatt undertaker and then john cena before that yeah i mean i guess at the very the very least you can now say that bray wyatt's first three wrestlemanias were him interacting with john cena the undertaker and the rock right the only problem then is how do you one up that unless he's gonna like get stunnered next year maybe you know maybe i don't know or really if he just wins the title by next year but that's not happening either yeah, all I know is they're babyface. Now, I'm actually curious if Luke Harper's going to be babyface with them when he comes back. Mm, or I he's... think he will, probably. He follows Bray, you know? Yeah, he does follow Bray. I highly doubt he'll gain his, his own, like, free will, in a sense. Uh, you know, just He already had him. that. He hated it. <laughs> yeah, he had that, and he hated it. He wanted, you know, he wanted to give it back to Bray, so there you go. This is what we're doing now. Bray's like, you know, Rock's right. Not only am I going to cut down on the Hot Pockets guys, but now... Now we're going to do good for the world. Um, all right, where do we start? League of Nations. Oh, I hate those guys. Let's do it. So, you know, there you go. Good stuff. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know, man. Um, I, I kind of personally, just from like a fantasy standpoint, I kind of hope their first feud is with the authority. I would. And here's the thing, dude. And let me just say this, too. I mean, we might as well have this discussion now since we've connected all the pieces. We know League of Nations is going to be their first whatever. I wouldn't be surprised if the authority was a thing. Now, I did hear, actually, the authority angle is going to end soon. I don't know if this came from Meltzer, but I've ha- heard that. Yeah, it was that... actually Falcon Arrow. He basically said that once Seth That's comes right. back, once Seth comes back, he's going to, you know, the authority is going to not be around for very much longer. But you know what? Even if they're not going to be a thing, I still kind of want a Bray Wyatt Triple H program, especially if Bray is the baby face. I think that could be fun and interesting. Uh, they don't have to do it, obviously. I just think it'd be a good idea. I just, I want to see them actually do it this time. You've turning them faces. It was a post-WrestleMania Raw crowd, so obviously they cared. I'm going to be curious how subsequent crowds react to a babyface Wyatt family. And if there is a reaction there, take my advice, WWE, just this one fucking time. Run with it. You killed them as heels. This is your last chance. They're babyfaces now. It's fresh territory. Do it. Go all the way with it. I'm not even saying world title. Do it! Yeah, do it! Don't Uh, let your dreams be dreams! Yeah, Shia LaBeouf, that son of a bitch. And I'm not even saying let him win the championship, because I know that's what a lot of people probably think I mean when I say go all the way. It'd be nice. I wouldn't be opposed, but you don't even have to do that. You don't want to know what I mean by saying take it all the way? Make him feel like he fucking matters. Because for the last longest time now, I can't even put a start and stop point on it. Bray Wyatt has not felt like he has mattered. And it's not just me saying it. I know you've said it, Ashton. I know people in the business, because I saw some people on Tweet, I'll be like, that, you know, review or whatever, that opinion's nonsense, because people in the business all loved it. Yeah. <sighs> okay, that's what I think of that. But even people in the business are like, Bray Wyatt has no credibility, because he does all this talk, and then he, you know, he sounds like he's going to stand on the throat of his enemies, and he only ends up laying on his back when it counts. Okay, make him fucking matter. Make him a winner because that's how people care. You want to bring down the machine. You're not going to do it through losses. So have him beat the League of Nations, have him beat whoever you got lined up and make him important because this guy is something special. And he still is. Guy hasn't changed in terms of what he can bring. The booking is just ass. So get your head out of yours and fucking fix this because you got something here. So I'm I'm done with the why it's I got nothing else to say unless you have anything you want to add. Okay, uh, let's move on then to our main event of the evening. You go Triple first. Triple H versus Roman Reigns, and this match was hilarious, man. I I laughed so hard while we were watching this match because Triple H and Stephanie tried so hard to get the crowd to boo them, and Stephanie specifically, to a degree, even succeeded a little bit because when Roman did spear her towards the end of this match, the crowd popped. But that yeah. was the only positive reaction Roman got in the entire match. Stephanie really put in the work. That's how you should have known WWE. 
that you were going to fail because you consciously really put Stephanie at the forefront from the entrance with her even cutting a promo as part of the entrance about how we rule you. We're the rulers, the leaders, all this, and you're nothing. After and- tonight, all hope will be gone. Well, I thought you meant Triple H would win, not this shit. <laughs> yeah, right. That is the only retort. That is the only retort. Well, she wasn't wrong. You know, yeah. so. Oh, man. And, you know, that's just it. Like, you had her do the work. You wasted the Stephanie pop. And I know you and I were even saying this a lot on live reactions. You fucking wasted it on him. Your ego was so in the way. You wasted something like this on Roman. I mean, I was even fantasy booking. Oh, can you imagine if we actually use the Steph pop for somebody like Sasha or Becky, or if you really wanted to use a man, maybe Dean Ambrose, that could rehabilitate him a little bit. Somebody, you know, some worthwhile, genuine baby face and notice the key word genuine, but you waste it on Roman Reigns who Roman Reigns as a worker is fine and can be one of the greats. And I'm going to say it for the final time as a fucking heel and given the shit that i've been hearing for what he's gonna do next i've given up all hope on you actually getting it you are so committed that reigns is gonna be the guy i have never heard booze for a baby face at a wrestlemania like that and probably in my experience ashton ever maybe you have because i know you've been watching this a little bit longer than i have i personally have never heard booze like that for somebody that was supposed to be the hero of wrestlemania he got him at 30, well, no, yeah, it was 31. He got him at 31 because Seth stole it with the cash-in, and people loved it because they didn't want the prospect of Roman winning the championship. They didn't want that match. And it was even worse this year because people knew no money in the bank to fall on, no deus ex machina, you know, that you could pull out the last second. Oh, wait, guys, I'm in this match because or this or that. No, you straight up went with Roman going over, and they shit on it, and you couldn't take it. You couldn't take it, but you, that it doesn't even prompt you to change course. At least I don't think it did. Maybe I'll be wrong, but I highly doubt it. And it's really sad because you have a guy that could be your top heel easily, easily with his look and his mic ability. I know I say it about Owens, but where Reigns edges out Owens, and I don't mean to be mean, but very easily. I mean, look at the man. How can you not hate him just by looking at his face? Like, I could probably be married 10 years. Roman Reigns gives one look to my wife and she's gone. And along with half my property value, mind you, but that's not the point. Like that's the kind of guy Roman Reigns is. And yet you think that he's our hero. It doesn't fucking work. And you know what the sad thing is, Ashton? I mean, I don't think you and I necessarily agree with this, but I actually did see a lot of opinions that said, you know, it's a shame that the crowd shit on it and that the alignments were what they were because as far as an in-ring perspective, it was a well-worked match. I don't think I would agree with that to a degree, but what does that matter when you don't have your story straight, when you're, when it's just so bad? I mean, what do you think? I don't know, man. I think right now it looks like they might be at the very least, they might be kind of embracing Roman as a little bit of a tweener based on his promo on raw. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, let, let's not even try and act like that promo on Raw wasn't heelish at all. And I agree. I, I agree, right? But, like, and I, you're not wrong. I, think I mean, if I, they wanted to go full-blown heel with him, I'm just the guy is the perfect catchphrase for him. As a oh, guy. my. Yes. See, dude. I'm not a I, bad guy. I'm the guy. Like, that is such a great heel catchphrase. Put that on a fucking shirt. I mean, he- heels apparently don't sell as much merch, but seriously, like, run with that tagline is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And why I side, just to put it in context, you're not wrong, Ashton. You're not wrong at all. I think why I side, and I think you can understand, with the current climate of WWE, booking-wise and everything else, like, if they do a tweener, you can do successful tweeners. We've fucking seen it. But it just feels so non-committal to me. It's like, oh, we don't want to acknowledge that we were wrong, but it's not that you're that you're wrong. You actually are right. So we'll do the middle ground to protect our ego and to satiate your own. We'll yeah. make him a tweener. Basically like, saying, we think we're right, but we also acknowledge that you think you're right. So we're going to compromise instead of just admitting that the crowd is what's supposed to tell us how to do our booking. And fuck that, man, because the thing is, a successful tweener is still loved by people. I mean, you know, to a degree, right? I mean, Austin, you could say, was a tweener because he did things to baby faces and heels, and he was just universally loved. But 
not even I wouldn't even say five percent of a crowd loves Roman Reigns. How are you going to pull off being a tweener? Just do the heel turn. Like uh, there, there's one saying that I love, and I, and I have to think about it here. You know, if there's a knife in my back, you can't call it progress if you pull the knife out only five inches or seven inches. It's only progress when it's fully out of my damn back. And if you're going to do a tweener, you've only moved the knife out of my back five inches. Take it out, do the heel turn, give him his run, and then you can turn him, baby. And see, that's what infuriates me, because you and I have said this for weeks. You'd think the WWE is thinking that we're telling them Roman can never be face, right? But that's not what we've been saying at all. In fact, quite the contrary, we've been saying he can be an amazing baby face. He's just got to go through the process first. You more than anybody have been saying, like, he can be that babyface. He's just got to get the heel run out of his system. Yep. But, but with the way WWE has been booking, you'd think that we told them, no, never a face turn, and they're just being a petulant freaking child about it. But we've never fucking said that. So what is this shit? And then you try and compensate with the pyro, and he's smiling, and I did it, guys, which, by the way, you did it for the third fucking time, so that's also really sympathetic. And your second Mania main event, and you actually won this one. Like, what about this man is sympathetic? What about, I I don't sympathize with this man at all. I can't even sympathize with the fact that he's getting booed. I can sympathize with the man because I know that he, you know, is a quality warrior. But as, like, the character, I can't connect with the character at all. At all. And it's sad. Really freaking sad. Oh, my God. And, yeah, Spear, and there was no, and that's another thing, too. I'm glad you brought this up. When we're talking about, like, the street fight and the Hell in a Cell and then this match, a match that was predicated on, oh, look at how I beat the crap out of Roman Reigns, and then Roman Reigns retaliates. This match was pretty tame. You had to distract a referee to do a low blow. You had to distract a referee to try and go for your sledgehammer shot, which apparently Roman Reigns' fist and his spear is a million times stronger. <laughs> and that's it. Like, oh my god, worst WrestleMania main event of all time. I don't know about that. But as long as I've been watching wrestling, I, I wasn't a fan, <laughs> really, at all. Uh, just really bad. I don't know, man. Roman wins. Do you have anything else you want to say? No, I think that it's worth uh, just kind of getting into our Raw review now. Yeah, let's do it, man. Well, do you want to do the uh, the old intro? Oh, oh, yeah. And now let us get into <laughs> our Monday Night Raw review. And I've got this one, considering I already pissed all over it. We open up with uh, Vincent Kennedy, Kennedy McMahon. McMahon. And I would like to talk about how fertile I am at 66 or whatever, uh, you know, for 15 minutes. 70, 71. Oh, he's 70, 71, damn it. But... I've got a story to perpetuate that could have been wrapped up nicely at WrestleMania, but no, no, I do things my way. So I'm going to cut this. You know what's this. really sad? What's that? Vince McMahon's birthday is one day before mine. Wow. How does that make you feel? We're the same sign. <laughs> oh, my. Well, thank goodness you don't believe in that crap. I was just going to if... say, if, if anybody ever wanted proof that astrology was complete BS, <laughs> Vince McMahon and I are the same sign. Oh, my God. I mean, let me just I, I, I wouldn't even feel right continuing without first saying first, I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and now that I'm. Now that I'm... <laughs> Now that I've gotten that out of my system, I mean... I mean, the only thing Vince and I have in common is that we both hate sneezes, and it's for completely different reasons. <laughs> oh, my God. For Vince. him, it's a power trip. For me, it's because allergies suck. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's why I hate sneezing, uh, too, even though my allergies really aren't that bad. When I get them, they are the worst. Yeah. But you know what else is Welcome the worst? Welcome to the human condition. Exactly. You know what else is the worst, though? Vincent. Haphazard storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> because after you're gloating, and you know, I really have people, now this is this is me talking, so maybe this will send off a few alarm bells, but I've actually felt, what's that word, remorseful lately. Wow. For saying, yeah, I know, I know, right? I've felt remorseful lately for being like, you know, I, I say a lot, 
that Vince is old and in the way. And, and a line that I've been using recently is the only thing I really want Vince to do is to make sure that the battery in his life alert are kept fresh. You know, I've been really, really hard on the guy. Maybe I could lighten up. And then this happens, and it's like, no, John, you're not a terrible person. You're just right. And there is a difference. <laughs> because, yeah, he gloats, and then Shane comes out, which, after being stretched out, it's great to see that you can walk on your own power hours later. I mean, Because this... McMahon genetics, damn it. <laughs> Jackhammer for a reason, Shane. Uh, and, you know, Shane's like, well, as the only man in the family, which was actually good. If you know Vince's ego, that was actually a great place to start, Shane. So I'll at least give you some credit for that. I'm going to say, you know, I lost. Congratulations. And he thanks the crowd, so he milks in that pop. I didn't like the crowd at the start for being enablers. Like, he failed. He failed each and every one of you. Don't don't you absolve him. I'm not. Um, so Shane is getting ready to leave. Vince calls him back. And then... Uh, You're not going to upstage me, damn it. I know. I know. You know, there was even... When DX reunited in, like, 2009, that whole period, and they did their feud of the McMahons... And they impersonated them in that one segment. Triple H even had a line that's like, oh, you know, Shane, anything that you come out and do, I have to outdo you. That's the way it works. And I didn't realize how right he was until this segment. <laughs> like, your own son can't even have anything. What the fuck must it have been like growing up in that household? Christmas is must have been totally awkward. Linda, you got Shane the 64 box coloring set? I want 120 colors. Do it! <laughs> And then he gets one. Yeah, like, I was going to say, Christmas in the McMahon household must have been amazing. <laughs> well, yes, but I mean, the idea that Vince would feel the need to compete with his own children over presents, which I actually, it's scary you how much I can actually believe that, is really sad and depressing. So he's like, yeah, you could run it. And then later in the show, just to kind of tie it all together, he assures Renee, oh, Renee, this is only temporary, because after all, with a television format like ours, nothing could go to shit in three hours that would make me lose the entire empire that I've, you know, inherited from my father and this legacy that I've built. It's going to be totally fine. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> I hate you people so okay, much. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so after this, because we can move on, right? absolutely okay after this the new day opens the show they come out they cut a promo they do the circle of life with the bootio from the night before and then we get our match between them and the league of nations it's two on two uh biggie and kofi against sheamus and barrett barrett eats the pin and then post match sheamus grabs a mic says there's something wrong with the league and we get the king barrett exile yep I liked your word choice there and how you played all on that. That was great. So, yeah, Barrett gets excommunicated. I guess just another sign that he's going to be leaving the company. I know it was weird, Ashton, because when you go on the WWE's YouTube page and, and you watch the segments, I actually watched this whole thing a few times because I'll be honest, the crowd really made it special with the whole Wyatt portion. Uh, a lot of people in the comments wanted to see Barrett have a face run yeah. like before he leaves, and that's just not going to happen, I don't think. Because he said that everybody can kiss his English backside. Yeah, I saw that. That was great. I mean, he's going, going, gone. I, I don't blame him. I don't even hold it against him. I even looked on his Twitter, and we've already, like, saw the one red flag was it's Stu Bennett, which we knew for a while. But he was saying, like, backstage at WrestleMania, and he was uh, refreshing the computer on rugby scores. Like, you can see where his priorities are. And, again, I can't even blame him. I'm not giving him any uh, flack for that. I mean, the guy put in his time. He never got the push that I felt like he was capable of, and I know you did, too. Uh, you could say injuries, but I mean, you know, I mean, if you really care about a guy, you're going to care about him and you're going to stand by him. Look at Roman Reigns. So, I mean, there you go there. So Barrett's excommunicated and he's out. I guess he's going to do whatever until June when his contract expires. Yep. Then we had the Wyatts. I freaking love this. If for no other reason, the crowd was singing along. And again, watching it a few times, I got more and more into it each time. And I'm like, you know what? I'm the fool for doing this, and I'll have nobody to blame but myself, but I can open my heart a little bit to this, and I can give this a chance. If they're, they're going to be baby faces now, the least I owe it is an open mind. And again, they've already lost everything. They're free to do anything. They want to be baby faces. Let's do it. So Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm hey, Tua is all about being positive and silver linings. We can find it. This is new territory for them, which means new possibilities, and that's not inherently a bad thing, so we'll see. And that's the thing, John. In general, baby faces don't get buried at nearly the rate that heels do. Exactly. So Bray actually has a longer shelf life this time around. 
Oh, my God. All right, so after that, though, uh, was the Vince segment with Renee. And then we get Summer Rae in the ring cutting a promo. She says that her team would have won last night if she was in charge, basically throwing that shade in Lana's <laughs> direction. Uh, and then she says, and, and you know, even though her team lost, at least she didn't end up flat on her face last night at WrestleMania like Sasha Banks did, which made no sense because Sasha didn't even lose. She just got held out of the ring by Ric Flair. Uh, but then Sasha's music hits. She comes down to the ring and gets in Summer's face, reminds her that she's the boss, slaps the taste out of her mouth. And then we got the match so sasha versus summer and this is a throwback to the bffs yeah and man has sasha come a long way because summer told sasha to get it together well sasha got it together in fact she got it so together she more or less obliterated summer this wasn't really much of a back and forth match get surpassed summer (laughs) yeah that's the new thing that is the new thing that is the new thing i'm gonna remember you said that and um i will say I, I love that Summer's trying to be the Kevin Owens of the women's division by picking a fight with just everybody at one time. Yeah, she he or att- Kevin Owens of different divisions. Oh, I know, right? He's so amazing in every <laughs> possible form. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, quick match, man, and Sasha wins at the bank. So it would have been nice, like, a post-match promo or whatever about last night. Because, I mean, did you see her WWE.com? It was, like, on the YouTube channel, like, what WrestleMania mentor? I mean, that was really emotional for one, but I would have liked a more in-character, aftermath kind of promo from her, but we didn't get that tonight. So, or on Raw, I should say. So, no, I didn't see that. It was really good, dude. She she cried, and she was like, just means the world to me that we made it. You know, this is all I ever wanted, and just means the world to me. Like, it was an out-of-character thing. She was so overwhelmed, so emotional. Tom Phillips even gave her a hug. She just, she oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I did actually see that, as a matter of fact. I did. I was like, oh, Sasha, you keep being you. You're going to do it. You're going to do everything. <laughs> See, I, I hate what's happening because I can tell that, like, my heart's starting to melt and I'm starting to feel, what's that other word? Compassion. Like, ew. All, especially in the women's division. All these talented women and I just want to give them all a hug and have the best for them and you can main event that mania. And you can do it. And just, Damn it. <laughs> so way to go, Sasha. Gets the win and she moves on. Yeah, yeah. And quick match, quick work. And then up next, we had Apollo Crews debut. And uh, what were you going to say? No, no, I was going to say, yeah, like, okay, like, I wanted you to really take the reins on this one because I'm curious. I know you and I were both a little skeptical. I what did you am. think about all this? You still are. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm still very skeptical because to me, you know, it's funny, too, because the more I think about it, the more I begin to kind of realize, like, maybe this makes the most sense. And maybe the reason that we felt like he wasn't ready is because he wasn't really connecting with the NXT crowd. But on that same note, I do, the more I think about it, feel like maybe he is more built for the main roster than NXT. I'll make a prediction right now, if that's OK. Yeah, Um, I will predict SummerSlam, I think Apollo may even win the Intercontinental title. Maybe from The Miz, even. Maybe The Miz is going to hang on to it. I could see a Miz-Apollo program for the Intercontinental Championship, that being the first title Apollo wins. So I'm going to say by SummerSlam, if not at SummerSlam, um, you know, or I should say before SummerSlam or at SummerSlam, Apollo Crews will be Intercontinental Champion. I, I, I don't think it's going to take that long, honestly. So I could see him doing that. And um, I guess you can kind of already tell by me saying that where I see the Intercontinental title going. I don't see Ryder ultimately regaining it. Maybe he will on SmackDown, but ultimately Miz is going to move on as the champion when that program ends. Uh, And then, yeah, I think him and Apollo across pads. So and to your point, Ash, and just kind of address what you said, I think you've got a point there. You know, maybe he will do better in front of main roster crowds and they can get more excited about who he is. I do think Apollo's got a good look and he's clearly got the in ring down. You know, he is an athletic guy. My biggest concern has always been promos, and I know it's been one of your biggest concerns, too. I highly doubt he learned how to cut them in his time in NXT. Uh, We never really got to see it, if he did. Um, You know, so it's going to be interesting how they overcome that. Maybe it'll be kind of like a Ryback deal with Ryback's first babyface run, or maybe he just won't say much. He'll try and keep it short and sweet. Um, I don't know. So it is concerning to me, but, I mean, it's new territory. Let's see how far Apollo can take it. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, obviously, we always wish the best for talents, and especially right. the ones that come from NXT, because those are, well, and New Japan, so just everyone. Uh, because those are the only two places that WWE ever gets their main roster talents from anymore. But anyway, yeah, I I, I definitely hope that Cruz ends up getting really, really over. Uh, I, I think that he can get more over on the main roster than he was on NXT, and that's great news from my opinion. I think that one of my biggest problems is that this kind of felt like you know, like they're they're bringing Apollo up, and we keep on saying like, oh yeah, Apollo is going to be the next uh, African American to become a WWE champion, and it just kind of feels like they kind of chopped him off at the knees. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like now, like rather than next WWE uh, African American WWE champion, now it's like, oh, next Kofi Kingston. Right. Yeah, I get what you're saying. You know what I mean? Like it feels like he's going to basically just have an entire career of smiling and putting on entertaining matches for the crowd and that's it yeah which is really sad because the, there is something there he just needs that person and see another thing like kobe kingston you just keep working on the parallels i think when he finally does find one it's not that it's not going to serve him well because look at what kingston's doing in the new day but i think in terms of getting to that main event level he's going to find it too late because I just, I just don't think if you ever would find it that it would be enough time to really do that. So I'm hoping you're wrong, and I'm hoping he does go to that next level. But, I mean, all signs are kind of pointing to you being right for the moment. So we'll see how it all turns out. Up next is Roman's coronation. Oh, boy. Um, well, I guess I shouldn't say oh, boy, because, I mean, it quickly became something interesting. Uh, Roman gets in the, in the, uh, in the, the ring and grabs a mic, and he says... I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a good guy. I'm the guy. And that's why at the biggest WrestleMania of all time, I beat Triple H's ass. You know why else that's an amazing catchphrase, by the way? Because I know you really, like, jumped on it earlier. If Triple H is serious and, like, we're in the reality era, what a way to just shove it in everybody's face. That he's not a heel, yeah. I'm literally just, I'm not a bad guy. Oh, well, that's the problem, Roman. Exactly. We still hate you, Roman. It's irrelevant. (laughs) Every time. Every time. But, um, yeah, he starts to talk. And then Chris Jericho, because he's a quality heel, right? Except, you know, he's done his time and people respect the career that he's built. He comes out. And then, Ash, I'm going to have you take it from here because I know, I think, I'm assuming this is probably one of your favorite moments of the night, Jericho's interaction with the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Jericho comes out and (laughs) the crowd cheers for him and they're all excited about him. And then he he starts talking. And at at some point, the crowd started chanting something. I don't remember what. Uh, And Jericho's just like, will you people shut the hell up? You're not hijacking this show on my time. Oh, no, it was, will you idiots please shut the hell up? You're not hijacking the show on my time. And then the crowd starts chanting, we are idiots. <laughs> it was amazing. And then Jericho goes, you know, you guys can keep chattering, but as long as you're talking, I'm not going to talk. And they kept going. Like, they didn't care. And then Jericho started talking anyway. So, I mean, seriously, consequences, what are those? What are those? Um... But yeah, Jericho says he wants the title. He demands that Reigns put him at the head of the line right now. And then AJ Styles' music hits. He comes out, points at the belt. Kevin Owens comes out, uh, points at the belt. And then Sami Zayn comes out, and we get sort of a pairing off. Owens and Zayn beat each other up. Uh, AJ and and Jericho beat each other up. And then eventually Roman hits a spear on Jericho to leave. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole thing kind of devolves into chaos. So we have these three guys who feel like they are, you know, worthwhile. Actually, no, I, I should say, like, yeah, four guys that feel like they're worthwhile contenders, AJ, Jericho, Zayn, Owens, they all pair off and, you know, brawl and do their thing. And, of course, Roman, you know, stands tall, spearing Jericho, the first guy to interrupt him to end it and asserting his dominance. So, yeah, good segment given the, you know, four people that got involved and Roman with that tease and that great line, fuck you, man, if you're still committed to be a baby face. Like, that was so good. All right, we can move on. Okay, so up next, Shane McMahon ran into Roman Reigns, told him that we were going to get Zayn, Jericho, Styles, and Owens in the Fatal 4-Way to determine a number one contender for Roman's championship tonight in the main event. And then we come back to the ringside, and Baron Corbin is there, and he grabs a mic and says, for those of you that don't know who I am, 
All you need to know is what this trophy tells you right here. And then he said that his arrival signified the end of days for anyone who gets in his way. See, now I've got to say, I don't know if you've seen many people, Ashton. I can tell you I've already seen a few people that are like, oh, this promo put me to sleep. I didn't like it. So once again, you and I find ourselves in the minority as far as Baron Corbin's concerned, because I still love this promo. Yeah, I was going to say, you're not supposed to like it. You're supposed to hate him. (laughs) Yeah. He's the heel, people. Yeah, I mean, I I thought it made the trophy seem important. And that was my favorite part of this trophy is all you need to know, like, just how good I am. Like, yes, way to make the Battle Royal seem more important than anything WWE has done since its inception. Yep. Like, way to go, Corbin. Uh, and he kept it succinct, too, which I think a guy like him, because, yeah, I'll admit, well, actually, no, I shouldn't even say his mic skills are bad, because I love when he just spins his wheels and just cuts a promo. <laughs> it's NXT stuff. Apollo, you're a failure. <laughs> So good. Um, and yeah, his debut is Dolph Ziggler, which again, I reiterate, perfect opponent because Dolph's of that like size. It'll be, you know, sympathetic when Baron Corbin's ragdolling him and he can bump and sell to really make it seem like, oh, I'm being brutalized. Uh, solid matchup gets to a point where Baron Corbin hits this sick boot at one point to Dolph Ziggler and sends him to the outside. I was scared that Ziggler was going to sidestep it. Uh, Corbin was going to go over the barricades. Ziggler was going to get back in, and it would be like an embarrassing first loss for Corbin. But no, he's just brutalizing Dolph, and he's so into brutalizing him that it's a double count out. Yep. Baron's freaking out, and he points at the referee, almost like Baron Corbin sees William Regal everywhere. And yeah. he's just like, this is on you! And he just continues to beat on Dolph, and he does the end of days on the floor. Uh, you know what? I'll say again what I said in live reactions. I thought this was a great debut. It was different because he didn't win dominantly, and yet he didn't lose either. It was a draw because Baron Corbin was more concerned with brutalizing his opposition than winning the match. Yeah, and I was going to say, the whole thing is like he didn't win at all, but he was still very dominant. Uh, Ashton, let me now that we're talking about Baron Corbin on the main roster, I'm going to... Uh, to ask you, I'll frame the question like this, right? You and I have done over under percentage questions before. Oh yeah. And I always like working with 50 cause it's a nice clean number. You know, it's middle of the road over under 50% Baron Corbin feuds with Roman Reigns this year. Do under. you think that's going to happen under under you think under yeah. I'm, I'm say like, honestly, I like 15% at most 15. Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually glad you gave it that percentage cause it's still higher than what I thought you were going to give it. I'm torn because I don't think he'd be, ready for that spot i want them to take their time with corbin but at the same time i wouldn't be surprised to see wwe rush it because they think oh you know corbin's got this heat right now let's feed it to roman so i'm torn but i think tentatively i'm gonna agree with you i'm gonna say under it's just something i wanted to put out there because i know wwe has done like freak pushes before i guess the last one they really did though was like sheamus back in 09 um but i don't think corbin's gonna be a similar case no but so where do you see Corbin going? Like, I mean, obviously Dolph's going to be his first program. I mean, I already said that I see Apollo winning the Intercontinental title fairly quickly. Could Corbin win the U.S. title fairly quickly? I Dude, mean, how Corbin Kalisto? That could be a great program. That could be a really fun program. Yeah. I mean, do you? I mean, like, I don't want you to catalog obviously the whole career of Baron Corbin, but do you think this first year is going to be kind of meteoric for him? Do you think he's going to kind of be middle of the road? I mean, because Corbin does have a great look, and I could see WWE doing at least one big thing with him. I just don't know what that big thing would be. I guess my default was just a program with Roman, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I mean, I don't think Corbin will work John Cena this year. I mean, I yeah, that. dude, I was even just getting ready to say I think that the biggest thing that they might do with him whether it's this year or next year. But as far as like his first really big major program, I could definitely see being against John Cena. And I would Corbin, I guess Corbin would at least win one match in that feud. Okay. Cause I, I feel like all the heels at least win that they don't win the feud, but they at least win one match in the feud. Exactly. Uh, so Corbin, you know, he may be able to say that he beat John Cena this year or next year. I just think within the first two years, like this year, now that he's on the main roster and then next year, Corbin's going to accomplish a lot because I think he has the look and the ability to accomplish. I, honestly, it's weird because Corbin is like a monster, like he's tall and powerful and dominant, but I feel like he's going to get booked almost more like a Neville or Dolph Ziggler. I don't know. Just a hunch. Right. Yeah. 
It's going to, yeah, Cor- I'll be honest, Baron Corbin's uh, trajectory in the WWE on the main roster fascinates me a lot more than Apollo Crews. Like, Apollo Crews, yeah. obviously, there's that curiosity there, but Baron, given that I just feel like the guy has a great look and a great presence, like, that's what fascinates me, because does WWE see in Baron Corbin what I see? Do they see more? Do they see less? So I'm going to be very interested in what he does on the main roster, because maybe I did jump the gun feuding with Roman Reigns already in his first year. But, I mean, John Cena, I, I think you have a point, Ashton. I guess we won't take that off the table. He's going to do something big this year. I feel it. So keep an eye out on Baron Corbin, people, because the lone wolf, man, I, I think the best is yet to come. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so after Corbin just destroys Dolph Ziggler, Zack Ryder comes out. <laughs> A harbinger for things to come. <laughs> and, and Ryder goes over, you know, the whole Intercontinental Championship thing with him and, and Razor Ramon, Diesel, whatever. Or no, it was Razor. Uh, Scott Hall. And then, you know, we get like this cool sentiment moment with him talking about how, you know, my the first experience I ever had with the Intercontinental title, I got to hold Razor Ramon's. And now Razor got to hold mine. And it was awesome. And then The Miz comes out and he challenges him for the title and we get a match. And they have a pretty good match. Really, really paint by numbers. This felt like an OVW match, honestly. Yeah. Uh, And then they kind of spill out. Ryder hit. Was it a Rough Rider on Miz on the outside? Uh, No, I I didn't. He did something to Miz on the outside, didn't he? Maybe it was like a boot or something or like a clothesline. It didn't really seem like anything too impactful. I didn't feel like. Mm. Um. Because, you know, then... You know, oh, that... oh, yeah, that's right. Miz actually drove Zack Ryder first. He drove uh, Zack Ryder back into the apron. That's right. And then he got into it with Zack's dad, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Ryder's dad pushed Miz and shoved him into the ground. And yeah. Maurice then hopped the barricade, go over, got in Ryder's dad's face, and then slapped the taste out of his mouth. And that distracted Zack Ryder long enough for Miz to hit the skull-crushing finale for the win. So your winner and new Intercontinental Champion, not Zack Ryder. Dude, now this is a combination of both, like, praising Zack as a babyface, I guess, and just, <laughs> and, just be, and just be taking the piss. Because this guy has the best reaction faces right before he knows his life is going to shit. Because when Eve Torres is kissing John Cena and he's in that wheelchair. Oh my god. That reaction. I mean, it's been memed. So that reaction is legend status. The WrestleMania where he got kicked in the balls. And he was like, Eve, what are you doing? Not shot. Was excellent, though I will say. I think our truth had the better reaction. Because she's like, oh, man, he really got done like that. And then when he sees his father get slapped, he just throws his arms up. He's like, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on, Zach. The end of your intercontinental title reign. (gasps) Oh, my God, it tastes even better a second time. So, yeah, his reaction faces. I just want somebody to gift me a scrapbook of just all of Zack Ryder's reaction faces during his failures. Because they are priceless. I could live another two million years on that as sustenance alone. Uh, So, yeah, Miz now, five-time Intercontinental Champion. I feel like Maurice is back with the company, I guess, in a valet capacity. Because I did see her... And the SmackDown graphic alongside Miz, so she's going to be accompanying him, you know, on SmackDown. And this is the feud now. So I'm torn between, man, I'm really angry they're hot potatoing the Intercontinental Championship and they're just shortchanging a worker like Zack Ryder to also just laughing at him because he had so much going for him and he's already lost the championship. So I don't know. It's a real conflict for me, Ashley. You might have to help me out with this one. Do I have to? I don't know. Do you? That's right. So, do you have anything you want to add to this? I think your reaction sums it up quite nicely. <laughs> it was amazing. All right, what what came out of this? 
Well, after this, we had Renee Young interview Kevin Owens. Uh, they talk about how Owens was robbed last night because he had to face off with six other men to defend his championship. Uh, and that Sami Zayn robbed him and that he was on to bigger and better things. And then he said that he was going to win tonight and then he was going to take down the Roman Empire. And that the road to KO Mania 2 starts tonight. I gotta tell you, there was so much preaching going on in this promo, all I wanted to do was shout amen at the end of it, because Kevin Owens, as per usual, two million percent on point. I mean, everything he's... Five million percent on point. There, we all we all good? Um, especially, you know, just the part about taking down the Roman Empire and KO Mania 2, which has only been delayed, not canceled, okay? Uh, and yeah, I just thought it was a great heel promo. I got to tell you, uh, until – because I don't think it's ever going to happen. Honestly, I don't think they're going to ever full-blown turn Roman Reigns heel. And I even said, like, if it didn't happen at WrestleMania, I was not going to have any serious discussion about it for the next 10 years. I'm just going to swallow my pill and just move on. Uh, but, you know, barring that happening, you know, it, unless Roman Reigns turns heel, I still think Kevin Owens has that top heel potential. He's just so consistently good when he talks. Like, I just, I love it. I love the confidence he has in his words. I love the charisma he has infused in them. Uh, anytime he interacts with Michael Cole especially, it is at its best. Because Cole, honestly, if I can compliment him on anything sincerely, he is a great foil for a personality like Owens. And he's just good with anybody, though. I mean, what's that one guy's name? <sighs> the guy he calls Millhouse. Normally, normally I know his name because I know he's been somewhat of a regular. Oh, but, uh, oh, oh my god. The yeah, guy that I know. Did, Rich Brennan. Rich, thank you, Ashton. Yeah, Rich Brennan. Ah, oh, that hurts. Millhouse, you know, and just all that stuff. Like Kevin Owens is great. You know, I I, I love him as a talker. I love him as a performer. And I, I will say to anybody that's willing to listen, and thankfully we have a lot of people that are willing to listen. You know, we love you guys. Best audience ever. Uh, Best you know, when my audience ever. Great comic book guy. I'll actually give you. A 10. So, like, Ty Dillinger there. Oh, did you, by the way, quick side note, did you see Shinsuke's reply to Ty Dillinger? No. They, they apparently got into a Twitter exchange. I guess Ty Dillinger said, I know said, that's like, a match that I would love to see, though. Uh, and I, I guess somewhere in that exchange, Ty Dillinger was like, well, I'm a perfect 10. And Shinsuke was just like, I'm an 11. And that that's was amazing. it. <laughs> yeah, right. And the best part is, he's not even wrong. But, yeah, I mean, anybody that's going to listen, I'm always like, Kevin Owens can take that goddamn ball and get a touchdown every single time as that heel, maybe except against Roman Reigns when you're trying to make him a baby base. That, that is something I don't even think Kevin Owens can score. And that's not even because Kevin Owens is bad. It's just that Roman Reigns is horrible at being a baby face. So yeah, great promo though. Indeed friend. All right. You have anything you want to say about this? Or can we move on? Up next was, Honestly, probably my least favorite segment of the night. Uh, Lita is in the ring with all the women's wrestlers from WrestleMania. You know, all ten women from the tag team match, and then all three women that were in the women's championship match. Uh, of course, she does a good job of making sure that she puts all of them over. And then she kind of brings up, like, when she was coming up as a kid, she didn't really have any really good role models, female role models, in wrestling that she could kind of look up to and say, that's who I want to be when I grow up. But now all of the little girls that are growing up now have plenty to choose from. And it was great. But then Charlotte gets in the ring and cuts a haphazard babyface promo. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really like that. I mean, look, I can understand right on one hand that the women, especially the four horse women, which by the way, just got to say right out of the gate, the, the pop that Bailey got and the chance that she got, goosebump inducing cole even had to deadpan bailey's not here just to squash it i guess for the at-home audience that they know are bailey fans that was amazing she even had to tweet out thank you dallas like that must have hit her pretty hard yeah. that she's still doing work in nxt that and they might have even been like the biggest thing that ruined this segment because if like if charlotte would have spent that whole time being like oh this is all i've ever wanted oh and being a baby face and then Bailey's music would have hit, it would have fixed everything. Yeah, yeah. But instead, like you said, it was it was a haphazard, it was mixed. I get that these women deserve a moment in the sun. I'm not trying to say that they don't, and I know you're not either. No, but, but Charlotte specifically, being the representative is stupid. 
Exactly. Like, why not have Lita say all these things? It's like, you know, it's because somebody tried to... Flair. Of course. Oh, and, and we haven't even begun on that discussion, apparently. Because, yeah, after Charlotte cuts that promo, lets the crowd get into it, she was about to go into her heel mode. But then the crowd started like, oh, they started a women's wrestling chant. Yeah. And Charlotte had to let them get that out. So she even jumped the gun a little bit, which I can't entirely blame her for. But timing, you kind of have it with that crowd, man. You never know. Or at least try and work them or whatever. And then she goes into her heel stuff. But I got to tell you, the star of this segment wasn't even anybody in the ring. <laughs> the star of this whole thing actually was you, my friend. Because oh, you, when all of this went to shit. You had the line of the fucking night because you actually asked. And I don't think I'm like hyperbolizing. I, I legitimately remember you saying, and you can correct me right here and now, please don't do this to me. Yeah, that's you exactly asked what I said. To, yep. You asked them not to do it. So now, partially being a dick, I have to ask, how does it feel that they're doing it to you? How does... <laughs> That sigh, though. Oh, my God. They're doing it to you, and they're doing it to you. They ain't even doing it to you in the ear. It is just, like, full on, man. Full on. Oh, my God. You even got your favorite, a Natalia promo. Uh, that, that was the part that I said, don't do this to me at. <laughs> when, Nat- when all the women left the ring and the only person left on the commentator's side of the ring was Natalia and I saw that she had a mic in her hand that was when I said oh my god please don't do this to me I don't think I have because ever... it was in that moment that I realized that okay first of all we were going to top off that horrible Charlotte promo with a, an even worse Natalia promo and now they're going to try and make me cheer for one person between Charlotte and Natalia when in all reality, they would be the best heel tag team in the women's division. Yeah. I have never seen a meter shift so quickly from awkward turtle to anxious aardvark <laughs> as you did when you registered that Natalia has a microphone. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's like, you knew everything was going to go to shit. And all at the same time, too. And plus, not only that, but in that moment, I also realized, wait, does this mean Sasha is not going to be in the title picture for the, the immediate future? Which makes no sense, because she never lost. Oh, and do you want me to make you feel even worse, potentially? Because this is something I don't I know thought if about. you can. <laughs> because Natalia, I don't think she will. But she has a greater chance of pulling this off, and by pulling this off, I mean beating Charlotte, than I think the other competitors, because if they're going to do this at Payback, and that's the title match, how much do you want to bet that it's going to be a repeat of that takeover? Oh, and Natalia? God. Ha- yeah. Bret yeah. Hart. Bret Hart. And you know if anybody can negate Ric Flair, it would be Bret Hart. No, because he didn't. He didn't negate Ric Flair at NXT Takeover. The that's first because one. he had no. That's because he had no reason to negate Ric Flair because Ric never got involved in the match. Oh. But this title reign is predicated on Ric Flair getting involved in matches, so Bret would have a legitimate stake to get involved himself. And you're groaning because you know it's all true. Like Natalia actually has a viable chance to be our second ever WWE Women's Champion. So, I mean, how are you feeling right now? Are you with us? I'm doing my Tina groan, okay? <laughs> I'm going to let him have it, people. He earned it. Because, holy shit, that desperation. Please don't do this to me. <laughs> that that actually beat. That actually beat. Please clap. Because I have never heard <laughs> anything so. Please don't do this to me. <laughs> Oh my god. You're just like, I pay my taxes. I'm a good <laughs> citizen. Don't do this to me. This is all that I have. <laughs> oh my god. Bro, That's I love it. Is too. It really was. Because that is all I had. Because that was the only decent match from the night before. I Dude, that's what I should forget paying taxes. You're like, I'm a loyal watcher of the product. I adored WrestleMania. This match was all that I had. Don't. Don't blow it up. <laughs> and they blew it up. And what did they blow it up for? And this is the most hilarious part. 
fucking nepotism, which you could argue this WrestleMania was predicated on with the Usos, Charlotte, and Roman Reigns all going over. I mean, it would have been over the top if Shane actually went over, but that was the only match where it actually would have made sense. So, like, oh, my God. I just want to let you know my eyes are watering, and I'm not sure if it's from laughter or if I'm actually crying. (laughs) We're going to make it. I promise. Oh... That might have just become my segment of the night only for the discourse that we had in the wake of it. But, yeah, I can't believe in all sincerity this is the fucking program you go with. Because now the big question for me, and you already brought this up, what does Sasha do? Because I'm sorry, I love Becky to death just like AJ, but good booking has to be good booking and and bad booking is bad booking. Becky tapped out. You can't just phone her into a program with Sasha. Oh, let's see who the number one contender for the Divas Championship or Women's Championship is. I gotta get used to that. Well, I'll tell you who the number one contender for the WWE Women's Championship is the person who wasn't part of the decision on the losing end. You tabbed out, Becky. There's no reason for her to be there. And what what's Sasha gonna do? Well, you, you know, know what? Let's 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 since you know what since we're doing this since they're trying to treat women as equals to men now. Let's get more than one program going. Let's get Becky against Alicia Fox. Let's get Sasha versus Paige. Let's freaking do this now. Yeah. I mean, right? If you're really serious about having women on equal footing with men, you can juggle multiple substantive, is the key word here, programs. Well, they don't even need to be substantive because, if anything, that would put the women above the men because not even the men have substantive stuff going on. Uh, see, but I'm I'm so loose to WWE and I have so ex- low expectations of them. I regard substantive as being more than all women hate each other. So, like, that's if, true. That's if true. You, if you can do more than that for the women, you pass. Barely, Barely. but you pass. Yeah. Get the fuck out of my classroom. <laughs> but, <laughs> dude. This whole thing, just to think they're going to rely on Flair versus Hart for the championship. Because, uh, and I get, how much do you want to bet, too? And they're probably going to shoehorn this in. We may get a video package, probably not, but we'll maybe get, like, images or references. Oh, well, their family, they fought over the world title, and now it's spilling over into the WWE Women's Championship. And they do that whole freaking thing. I and foresee like, a lot of pictures of Natalia and Charlotte as teenagers hanging out with wrestlers. Yes, that's happening. That is, that is totally happening. In fact, we can say now that you called the shit out of it, because even if it hasn't happened yet, it's going to. So why even bother? Um, yeah, I mean, this segment... Oh, I you mean, know what? That... By the way, I, I never brought this up earlier, although it right. did It did happen earlier. The villains got a vignette. Yes, they did. Smackdown, people. That's going to be an exciting Smackdown review to do, if for no other reason you guys get to see me geek out. Uh, when we talk about the Vaude Villains debut, because it's just so cool that they're getting the call up. And honestly, I do think they're ready. You know, they had their NXT tag title run. Well, it's one of those things where what else is there for them to do in NXT? Yeah, they, I mean, they were in a program. That's how I feel about Enzo and Cass, too. Like, once you lost to the Revival, there is just nothing else that you can possibly do. Exactly. Like, the only thing that the Vaude villains have to do, which they may even do it on this next set of tapings, just kind of round it out. Even though I would, you know, not mind if they didn't do it. Uh, I think they have to put over the hype bros because they are in a program with them. Oh, I didn't God. Think I get that win. I hate John. it. I, I know. I know. Why would you do that to me? I Dude, I don't know, all right? <laughs> Look, the program's a thing. You know it. I know it. It's got to be finished. I don't, so. think it's a, I don't think it's a program. I think that they're just pushing the hype bros, and they happen to trample over the vaudevillains on their way up. But this push was all based on the vaudevillains beat us, and apparently they beat us aggressively. And for Mojo, it's like, well, maybe we need to take this more seriously. And then they've started stringing the wins together, so they need to beat the vaudevillains to make. It just is what the story they're telling. Yeah, I'm so. sure they will on the, the tapings or something. I don't know. Who cares? Oh, man. You know, I, I feel like we've, we've really put you through the ringer, but let's let's move on from this segment. Maybe talk about something more positive. Thank so, you. So, yeah, what, what came next? Renee Young backstage with AJ Styles. Well, that's that's something positive, right? We're getting there. We're, we're getting a little bit warmer. Um, yeah, There's I mean, not AJ, really a lot to say here, though. Like, AJ's promos are never really super substantive. Yeah. And you know what? I don't really think they need to be, you know, necessarily. Right. Uh, I think it was good enough. 
Um, and yeah, he's pretty much saying it's a great opportunity and I'm going to seize it and all that good stuff. So yeah, good promo again, like you said, not substantive, not really memorable, you know, but it was what it was. Absolutely. And then the, the, one of the things that I really am looking forward to talking about, or at least seeing and being able to talk about in the future, the visit Puerto Rico promo from Primo and Epico. Yes. Yes, in I fact, think, John, I, I'm serious when I say you and I are the only people left that actually like Prepico. Oh, we can bring that name back now, right? Yes. 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 I can pull a Knight of the Roxbury. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm actually glad. That's one of the TwitWow gems I'll be glad to dust off and use again. Uh, yeah, this Prepico there vignette. There are so many people watching this that have no clue what we're talking about. Oh, man. That gotta Prepico be... name, that's from, like, 2011, 2012. That was from when we first started TwitWow. Vintage TwitWow! Um, I just got to ask you, brother, right out of the gate, let's let's kind of volley this vignette a little bit in our discussion. Was this a babyface vignette or a heel vignette? What vibe did you get? I got off heel vibe off of this. I did, too. Yeah. And I be... shouldn't have, because, really, they were just showing national pride for their country, but... <laughs> in general, you know, WWE audience is expected to be incredibly xenophobic and therefore hate Puerto Ricans. You know, if we ever bothered to give that more than a modicum of thought, I don't know if we'd be able to sleep at night, because that's kind of terrifying, you know, that you're just so against people being proud of other countries. Yeah. I, well, there, there yeah, yeah, I, I did it. I gave it more than a modicum of thought. I ain't sleeping tonight, but regardless... <laughs> Yes. This, uh, I loved these guys though back when they had Rosa Mendez. Oh my god. I think one of Their the most... tag title run was so good back in 2012 and it was so underrated and oh, I can I hope they get back to that. Dude, I'm so glad you said underrated because I was even going to like going to put these qualifiers cuz I was going to say they were underrated but they were tag team champions. So I didn't know if it still worked, but then you said it so I actually no, feel I think it's underrated in that that was during an era where tag team champions meant nothing. Right. Right. Like, them holding the title would have been about as prestigious as, like, El Torito holding the title. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know what's funny, dude? What I liked about this Puerto Rico vignette, I'm not saying this is the direction they're going to go with it, because, you know, we already kind of saw that, maybe in a way, with Rusev when he debuted. But it would be cool if the story here is, you know what, they were matadors, they weren't getting anywhere, so they went back to their roots, they loved it, it's a beautiful place, they come back with this renewed sense of pride. You know, not even nationalistic or anything, nothing over the top like that, but, like, they go back to their roots. Well, no, and, and I don't think that they're even acknowledging that they were ever the matadors. Right, yeah, that's just a part of the wall. Like, it's I mean, just, just like the return of Primo and Epico from you know, 2012, 2013, when they were last seen. Right, and you could say, like, oh, they spent all this time in Puerto Rico, they just they yeah. feel rejuvenated. And they just fell right back in love with the country. Right back in love with the country, they're rejuvenated, a new sense of purpose. Yeah, and, and then, especially, you know, too, because, like, the like in general, Matador is a Mexican stereotype, not a Puerto Rican. Like, what, wasn't it right, was it right back that made fun of them? No, it was, you know, it was Titus O'Neil that made fun of them for being Puerto Rican Matadors. Right, yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you something, dude, if they are heels, which you and I got the same vibe, I would not have any qualms at all with them doing a program with Babyface New Day. Because I think New Day, with two guys that aren't really known for their promo ability, could pull something great out of them, if for no other reason, just the jokes on them. I want it. I want it, John, yes! I want it too, dude. I want Prepico, and I can't tell you how fucking good that feels to say again. We're, we're totally, yeah, yeah, Prepico all the fucking way. <laughs> uh, that I want, you know, them to get back to that prominence. Like, I love New Day, but they don't even need the tag titles. In fact, I think they're far and above those tag titles right now. Uh, oh, mainly and, and because by the way, by the way, yeah. no... No, the WWE A shouldn't and B won't bring back Carlito, so stop. But yeah, they don't need him. We don't need him. Uh, and he I, doesn't I need it. He doesn't need it. I, I don't think he's it. interested, to be perfectly honest. I don't think – look, Carlito's even said in interviews that Primo was the more passionate one in the Cologne family about pro wrestling than he was. Yeah. I feel like he just did it because, you know, again, nepotism kind of thing. And he did seem to have somewhat of a knack for it. But, yeah, he said Primo cares far more about this than I do. So 
I'm glad that Primo might actually be given some attention here because him and Epico are both wonderful and you don't need to give them a stupid, stupid freaking gimmick to do it. I am so glad we were getting this. And you know what's funny? I feel like this is the only vignette we got all night. And yet, talking about it now, I realize that maybe I kind of undersold it when we first saw it on live reactions because this is freaking awesome. It may not be NXT, but I'll take it because we're getting an amazing tag team back at a time when the tag team division desperately needs a revival. So really, if anything, the tag team division, I think, was the big winner here because we have vaude villains we know are going to be on SmackDown, Prepico, and then something that we'll get into a little bit later. This is a good night for tag team wrestling, I think. Yeah, you're totally right, too. Yeah, and and that's another thing, too, is um, we could kind of do almost like a makeshift Los Aviadores here. I mean, obviously, we're not going to, uh, but I don't know who really pays attention or paid attention, I guess I should say, to FCW when that was a thing before it became NXT and went to full sale. But uh, Primo wasn't in it, but it was Epico and Unico, actually. Uh, So you can only imagine how great those guys were together. They were actually a tag team, and they were tag team champions in FCW for a while uh, as Los Aviadores, which is just Spanish for the Aviators. That sounds amazing. Yeah. That's everything I never even knew I wanted until you said it. Yeah. So, like... There you go. There was I mean, actually there was actually a period of time after they lost the titles too, where Unico was given a really solid like mid upper mid card push. He won, if I remember correctly, if not win, he was at least in the original tournament to crown the the first ever FCW 15 champion, which was kind of like the workhorse championship, where like every match was an Iron Man match except it was 15 minutes, and then like if it went to a draw, they increased it to 20 and then 30. Yeah, man. That just sounds perfect for him. So, like, even back then, FCW knew that Hunico was a freaking workhorse. Exactly. exactly. He's so freaking good. And yeah. so are Primo and Epico. And you know what? I'm, I'm glad that we did this review again for reasons like this, because I feel like I kind of lowballed it in live reactions. Like, oh, it's a cool vignette. No, these guys are amazing people. And, th- and this is what the tag team division needs. Yeah, I would definitely say the tag team division was the big winner tonight on Raw. Uh, given everything that we got involving tag teams. And yeah, Primo and Epico, I actually kind of hope they're the ones to beat uh, Face New Day now, because I don't want League of Nations to do it, and I don't think the Dudleys are going to do it. So Primo and Epico, I think, are an excellent choice. Let's get to it. Absolutely. Up next, we had... uh, Oh, what did we have? Tables match. Usos, Dudleys. Um, Don't care. Apparently there was a, a... botch on this from the ring announcer and from the the, the the timekeeper where the Usos going through the tables on their own volition wasn't supposed to be the end of the match. The Dudleys got all pissy about it and they actually threw uh, Jay Uso through a table and then got on the apron and yelled at the timekeeper to ring the bell now. Okay. Wow. Uh, just kind of like to put that message through like, no them going through the tables by themselves wasn't the end of the match. We have to put them through the tables. Uh, okay. Those, so, tag, those tag, those, uh, table match purists that the Dudley boys are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't win the match that way. Yeah. I didn't care for this match at all. I don't care for this feud. Too many super kicks. Oh my God. I I'm, I'm so done. Like you're not the young bucks. You never will be the young bucks. You suck. Go away. Uh, and thankfully, it. Ap- apparently they will, Ashton, because, and I'm going to let you do the big unveiling of the surprise if people didn't already know what happened next. Yeah, because then after the match, the Usos hightailed it out of there. And as the Dudleys were walking up the ramp to leave, Enzo and Cass hit. They The music hit. They came out. They were amazing. Enzo specifically was just so freaking on point. Dude, I'm so glad you said that because here's the thing. Colin Cassidy, who's who's a great guy, you know, great on the mic, great look. He doesn't even need to talk. He can just stand there and look intimidating and it would be good. But then he opens his mouth and it's like, oh, my God, he's got that, too. Yeah, he's amazing. I'm not trying to shortchange him. But the thing is, Colin Cassidy, like he really has the look of a star. Enzo was a star last night. He fucking slayed it like. This is great, my, amazing mic work even, done in a PG environment because he was genuinely funny. Yeah. And he didn't have to swear. He didn't have a potty mouth. I got to tell he you, He didn't man, even have to devolve to Cena and make gay and testicle jokes. 
He did it. And you know what? Even though you could say, like, the closest person to Enzo's humor would be a, a rock-type persona. Day? The New Day, maybe, which the New Day do it really well. But, like, all the stuff that The Rock did, Enzo, I felt like, blew The Rock, what he did with the Wyatts out of the water last night. He cut Bubba. And yeah, especially... The Rock always feels so rehearsed. Yeah. And yeah. Enzo, even though he is probably just as rehearsed as The Rock, his lines felt so much smoother than The Rock's. Well, see, Ashton, I feel like you've said this before, too, when you've, like, talked about what makes a good promoist. I feel like it's all in the delivery because I yeah. feel like Rock, and I don't know if it's the age or just these kind of over it or whatever. I don't want to say it feels mechanical, but it does. It feels like a paint-by-the-numbers kind of thing. With Enzo, the guy has so much energy, and he goes a mile a fucking minute. Yeah. And that's what makes it work, dude, because— Talking about he... how you're so ugly that when you cry, your, fi- your tears run down your back to avoid your face. Hey, dude. Dude. And that's the thing. You may be right, and you probably are, that the lines are heavily rehearsed, but Enzo's got such delivery, you would never even know it. Because to me, when I'm watching it, I'm thinking, oh my god, that brain, I'm surprised smoke isn't coming out of his ears because he's just thinking at such a fast rate, nobody can keep up with him. And the Dudleys certainly couldn't. Devon was ready to throw down because he was talking about setting that lazy eye straight. That was another great one. Yeah, that was so good. Dude, Enzo stole. I mean, again, both Enzo and Cass like, don't want to shortchange Cass. You know, Cass. maybe you should think twice. It'd be two times more than you'd thought all day. Um, dude, dude, these guys are, and we've been saying it, so it's not, you know, news. These guys are fucking it. Like, if anything, for guys like you and me, and I know others. I'm not saying it was just us, but we've been saying forever: call them up, call yeah. them up. They are what the tag team division needs. And then they call them up, and it's a massive success, and they're just scratching their head wondering, you know, I wonder why we didn't do this sooner. Exactly. And And I want to know the same thing. I want to know the same thing, too, and I'll tell you something. I have never felt more validated in my life Yeah. because, you know, man, they brought it, man. I got to say, for all the debuts, you know, we've had as far as WWE goes – this may be the best debut so far this year. Uh, good luck with any of the time. I know Baron Corbin winning the Under the Dead Memorial Battle Royal. That was big in like an in-ring context. But in terms of just a debut overall, like letting the audience know who we are, which because it was like a really mixed crowd of all over the world and stuff, a lot of people did, which I think that worked to their advantage. Yeah. I think these guys are going to run with the ball. This was amazing. And this is the program I know you and I have wanted with Heel Dudleys. This is a proper transfer of that heat. You know, give it that baby face sympathy. Colin Cassidy, I think, is one of the best hot tags in the game today. Uh, Enzo is really great at just being ragdolled and stuff like that, you know, and doing the kind of offense he does. They're the perfect tag team. And quite honestly, if you have, I mean, let's link the chain together, Ashton, because we talked about the Prepico vignette. If you have Prepico win the tag team titles of a babyface New Day, uh, that'd be a great program for Enzo and Cass. If, for some reason, you still have Heel Dudleys get in there, obviously you could revisit that and just make it about the titles. Hell, Enzo and Kaz are so good, I wouldn't even mind League of Nations winning the tag titles if it meant the end game was Enzo and Kaz win. Yeah. The, this is a babyface team that can pull the best out of any heel team, regardless how, of how you and I feel about them. They are just that good. So, whatever happens going forward with the New Day, because they got to drop those belts eventually, it's in good hands because Enzo and Kaz are finally here oh my god this was amazing yeah my, yeah, my segment of the night did you say this was your segment of the night too because th- this was just so good i think so yeah oh i mean it, it really does kind of come down to this and the return at the main event yeah which we'll get to in uh probably a few moments i think it doesn't seem like there's that much more to go through but yeah this was amazing was, so proud of these guys really really well done um Enzo and Cass are amazing, but sadly this didn't lead to any physicality because the Dudleys acted like they were going to get in the ring and then they backed off. Right, right. Live to fight uh, another day. Yeah. So we had Renee backstage with Sami Zayn, and Sami says that he thought last night was the biggest night of his life. Now he's going to compete for a chance to be in the world title picture where he thinks he belongs. And then Kevin Owens attacks like the douchebag that he is. Oh, uh, you just had to put that in there, didn't you? Yeah, because he comes after Sammy and he power bombs him through a table, and you must be real proud of yourself there, Kevin. You're you're such a great example for the children that you kind of seem to hold in such high regard. Whoa, whoa, you're yeah. really tra- you're transgressing on sensitive ground. Yeah, you might that's that's the idea. 
Yeah, well, we're still getting an Italia Charlotte program, so enjoy that. Second of all, though. And I'm going to kill myself today. <laughs> and neutered. Uh, but no, in all seriousness. That's um, not the kind of cutting that I was planning on doing later tonight. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I enjoyed this from Sami Zayn. And in all sincerity, like, I could go into hyper Kevin Owens fan mode, and I, I will admit You're it's hilarious. To, just do it. Yeah, well, you know, we all know that Sammy, the only thing he was doing during that Fatal 4-Way was picking splinters out of his ass, which was hilarious. Uh, that's what you get for sticking your nose in other people's business. You're a failure. You're always going to be a failure, and you make me sick. Uh, but now that I've gotten that out of my system, and Kevin Owens is better than you in every way, um, this was a good promo from Sammy. This is the kind of booking, though that if WWE would stay consistent with this, and that's why you and I hated that he pinned Kevin Owens so early in his main roster run, because things like being attacked and taken out of a world title opportunity go, go such a long way to make him sympathetic. Like, if we're looking at it from a booking perspective, it would have been cool to see Sammy compete in the match, obviously, because, you know, he is a great worker and all that stuff, but I actually feel like this is great. I mean, one, for the Kevin owens Sami Zayn feud, and two, if you're thinking long-term, like, this guy should be a guy whose run is predicated on so close, but not quite there until he finally gets there. Yep. I mean, you could literally say it's like a Daniel Bryan situation because I could see he got screwed out of the fatal four way here. We've talked about money in a bank in the lot in June. I could see him again, having that moment. He's on the top of the ladder and whether it's with a steel chair or something, Kevin Owens takes that from him too, or some heel, you know, this should be a guy that never quite gets to taste victory until the biggest possible stage. Now you would think, well, WrestleMania main event. I don't know if WWE has that much confidence in Sammy knowing them. I doubt it, but I could buy it. This is the kind of booking that works for a babyface like Sammy. So I like the promo. Obviously, I like the beatdown, but not just for the obvious reasons, you know, on the surface. I just think it's good booking, and it's a good way to really jumpstart this feud. Uh, really makes it seem like if they are going to go to SummerSlam with it, I would love to see them have, like, a last man standing or some type of match of that style. So we'll see what happens. But, yeah, this is great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do we want to move on? Yeah, we can move on. Okay. Up next, we had... Our main event of the evening, Kevin Owens, AJ Styles, Chris Jericho, and what was supposed to be Sami Zayn. But then we get an announcement from Lillian. Sami Zayn has not been cleared to wrestle, and therefore, due to Shane McMahon, this is still going to be a Fatal 4-Way match, but the fourth member will now be... Q Cesaro's music, Q Market of the Century, Q OMG, I can't believe this is happening, Q John... Pulling a complete 180 on Kevin Owens faster than the speed of light. I did. I did. And all these hours later, even after the result, I remain unapologetic. Because one, it's partially an ego thing, too, because I still think Kevin Owens would be better served with the briefcase since that's more of a heel device anyway. And it was just so freaking good to see Cesaro back on TV. And can we just... Can we just acknowledge that sexy freaking elephant in the room? How he got into that ring gear, though. What a beast. It's already he didn't need been... to get into it. He had it on the whole time. Exactly. He tore the suit off, and that was probably the most... I mean, eat your heart out, Hulk Hogan. I mean, you probably will have to. That's the only way WWE is going to acknowledge you. But regardless, uh, just the way he got into that ring gear. Absolute stud. I mean, and the pop he Jason got, man. Statham 2.0. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? If that's going to be part of his stuff, I wonder if he's worked on his promo cutting since healing. I mean, I don't know what you can do from home, you know, when you're healing from an injury. But I know WWE is like, well, Vince mainly. Oh, uh, you know, he needs to make a connection. That pop should show you that he has a connection. I mean, they're called the Cesaro section for a reason. And he hasn't missed a beat because he was an absolute beast. I miss those uppercuts. I really just miss Cesaro in general. What a great return. The first of many to come. And I don't know what Cesaro does now. You know, I've been saying, and I still believe, Kevin Owens' best candidate for Money in the Bank. Maybe they would want to give it to a guy like Cesaro. And it's funny, because I was talking to a friend today, Ashton, and they were a bit more pessimistic. Like, they like Cesaro, and they're a fan. They just worry, though, that with all the other returns we have coming, it's just going to push Cesaro further down the card. And I could see where they're coming from, but I'm, I'm hoping he's wrong. Uh, you know, I, I would really love to see Cesaro finally get that push, finally take that ball and run with it. But, man, when Seth Rollins returns, though, that pop is just going to be legend status. It I don't sure know. Is. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, if you want my honest opinion, and I said this on live reactions, I think the first thing that uh, Cesaro is going to do is a program with Jericho. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, I could see – 
uh, Jericho now, like, working with Cesaro, which I wouldn't mind. Well, and plus, yeah. isn't isn't Jericho supposed to be working with Nakamura come summer? Like, july uh, uh, Yeah, I have been hearing rumors about that, and that timetable does seem accurate. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, Jericho's going to be working with a lot of people, apparently. I don't know what they're going to do with Cesaro. I don't know what they're going to do with Jericho, given the outcome. But this is a really fun match. You know, I enjoyed it. I think you had all the great elements. You had a stare down between AJ and Cesaro. They got a huge reaction from the crowd. That's a match they clearly want to see. And, uh, you know, just great back and forth all around. And then, like we already kind of talked about earlier, AJ gets the win after the Styles clash on Jericho. AJ Styles going to payback to face Roman Reigns. Um, okay, before we unpack that, Ashton, is there anything you want to say about the match? I was actually ready to move on, to be perfectly honest with you. Okay, well, um, do you just want to have this quick talking point before we get into our next, like, formal segment? Yeah, dude, absolutely. Yeah, AJ is number one contender. I mean, I'm, you and I have already kind of talked about in conversation the different things we've been hearing. The one thing I've been hearing is that they're actually maybe planning AJ Styles' heel turn, uh, uh, Anderson and Gallows. God, yeah, I can't even speak right now. Can uh, I ask debuting. something? Sure. Where did you hear this, and specifically, was it from an actual news source, or is it just fan speculation? I think a little of both, because I know fans have speculated it, but I feel like I did read it as a news source somewhere. Probably no DQ. I'm going to see if I can just find it real quick, because I'm actually on the page. Um, but, I mean, if that does happen, I, I first of all, I think it's absolutely stupid to turn AJ heel, because I just, I, not right now anyway, can he be heel in his run? Why not? You know, I'm not entirely opposed, but um, I don't know if that's really the best thing to do. Um, oh, actually, this was something I read about Anderson and Gallows, and this, again, I'm reading from NoDQ right now. Uh, I hear they're expected to make their first appearances with the company at some point next week. So, at some point in the next week. In the next week, yeah, in the next week. So yeah, that's a thing. I don't know. Raw, probably NXT, though, if we're being honest, right? That seems like the most... Most viable guess, but well, uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think that there's a very good chance that it is on Raw next week. But I mean, you know, personally, I don't think it's going to happen. It's an interesting theory. I don't put stock in I, it. I think that that's all it is. I think it's just a fan theory. I think that it's just fans really aching to see the Bullet Club and like us not being convinced that Roman is going to be the heel in that match. Right. And, and again, like, that already squashes that because, I mean, you're still, right, no way that Roman's going to turn heel for that program. It's just going to be a, qu- a quote-unquote face versus a legitimate face for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, right? I think, I already said, I think Roman's going to be more of a tweener. Oh, yeah, you did say that. You did say more of a tweener, which you're not wrong, but WWE's logic by that still continues to annoy me. Um, I mean, I'm curious about it. I'll give him that much credit. Like, I'm cu- like what are the promos going to be like? I think those two can work well together, so the curiosity isn't even really in ring. Curiosity is purely build up based. Like, oh, how are and, you going to? And by the this? way, uh, just to put this out there, the main event of SmackDown uh, was this match in tag form. It was AJ Styles and Cesaro versus Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens. Yeah, yeah. So that should be a, that should be a good matchup. But uh, yeah, I don't, really don't know what anybody does. You know, at this point, I mean, Jericho's freed up. Styles. I agree be- with you, dude. I think Jericho Cesaro are going to pair off. Honestly, I want Cesaro to win that feud. It would make the most sense in the world. But if they're going to try and build Jericho for Nakamura, maybe it would make sense for Jericho to win. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because you do make a point. I actually forgot briefly about Nakamura. And I thought to myself, well, did they have AJ go over at WrestleMania, you know, to get kind of that heel heat so maybe he could transfer to Cesaro? But then, of course, he got pinned by AJ the next night. So I, it's like... All that stuff, man. So much going on, but... Yeah. You know what they could do with Jericho, but then I would be left wondering what they're going to do with Cesaro. You know what, dude? I'm calling it right now. I, I It just came in my mind. Cesaro and Jericho are going to be the first feuds for the NXT guys. Jericho, Cruz, Cesaro, Corbin. Okay. Because you can, can, you, can, you can build Cesaro by having him beat Corbin. You can have Corbin lose a match or two to Cesaro without him losing credibility because of how much of a freaking beast Cesaro is. Dude. And yeah. you can have Jericho use his veteran cheaty tactics to get one or two up on Apollo Crews without making Apollo Crews look weak. Right, right. Dude, Corbin Cesaro specifically. Yeah. That's a matchup I never knew I wanted. And now you said it, you like put it out there, and I'm just like, yes, that needs to happen. 
Well, like that would be a Haas fight for sure. And it's one I want to see. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that said, I mean, there's not really much like more discussion points I wanted to go through. I mean, well, let me ask you one more thing before we go to the next one. Cause I always like, I love getting inside your head. Cause you know, I think you always, you're an intelligent guy. You know what you're doing. What do you think about this program? I mean, are you intrigued by AJ Roman? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, my, I even said at the end of the night last night on live reactions, the one thing they did right is that they got me to want to tune in next week, and that's mostly because of this. All right, follow-up question. Do you think this program can se- – well, I mean, I guess succeed is an ambiguous term because to succeed, you have to have an aim, and we don't know what WWE's aim is. Exactly. So I guess it's wrong to say, do you think this program can succeed? But, I mean, I guess you're just anticipating, again, people just booing the crap out of Reigns and just supporting the hell out of AJ. Yeah. And, yeah, AJ's not winning. Everybody's convinced no, of that. Absolutely not. Yeah, he's not winning. Uh, it's cool to see him in this spot. You know, I, I again, I think he's amazing, you know, around this time, feuding for the IWG. <laughs> Although, it's so funny. Yeah. It's so funny, dude, because you used the same exact logic to say Zack Ryder wasn't winning, and then what happened? <sighs> he won. Yeah, he won. It would really be something if AJ won that world title, man. I don't think it's happening. I think, honestly, I legitimately, and this is even based on Falcon Arrow, I think Roman is holding the title to at least SummerSlam. Yeah, and then save us Rollins. Yeah, Uh, exactly. It's going to be Rollins for sure. Yeah. But then, dude, but that's the thing, though. Rollins is coming back as a face for sure. Oh, my God, yeah. That's all but confirmed at this point. Falcon Arrow even said, like, yeah, they're going to embrace it. Yeah, yeah. And what do you do? Because, I mean, the the idea that that Roman Reigns could conceivably have, like, all these face versus face title matches, because let's be honest, I mean, AJ is already guaranteed to be one. And then him versus Seth is going to be another. That's still two more than you have in most babyface championship reigns. Because if you're going to get babyfaces, other babyfaces involved in title matches, they're usually multi-man matches. And yet Roman is going to be carrying this car with just one other guy. Just really interesting to me. Um, that said, though, I mean, like you, I'll be hooked into next week. I'm going to be very intrigued to see what they do. Whatever their aim is, I don't even know if I want to hope that they succeed because I feel like some of their aims are absolutely backwards, but I digress. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they treat this whole program going forward. So with that said, let us get into our next segment, high spots and low shots. My low shot, Zack Ryder. <laughs> I mean, Come on. At least he won the title and he has a rematch. Well, yeah, but he lost it. And not only uh, that. But I think this is going to be a high spots, low shots that includes both Raw and WrestleMania, not just Raw. That actually, you know what? Then I'll, then I'll say this, and I and I didn't want to say it, but because you made it like that, you made me give it to somebody that I was glad to give it to, to somebody I'm kind of heartbroken to give it to. My low shot's got to be Sasha, because you lost the the Divas Championship, now the inaugural like. Women's Why would it not be Becky Lynch who actually tapped out? Because we well well it's even worse because Sasha didn't do anything wrong and she's still out of the equation. At least when you lose, you know that you lost, and you've got to pick yourself up again. Saja has a legitimate gripe because, oh, I wasn't even part of that decision, and I'm still getting screwed. So, yeah, really crappy night for somebody that wasn't as bad as they could have been, and yet they still got the same treatment anyway. So, Saja's my low shot. Who's your low shot? You have nobody but yourself to blame. I was going to do Zack Ryder. We, we were good. We, we, were, we were really good. And then you're I like, didn't no. feel like Zack Ryder made sense either. I don't think Sasha or Zack Ryder makes sense. Well, we're going with Sasha. So who's your low shot? What? Whatever, man. Because at least she beat Summer Rae. Becky didn't even compete. She just had well, all that salt. You're going to love this one then. My low shot is Kevin Owens. Because he lost his championship. And then he decided to forego going back after his championship to go after the world title, which he failed at. You know what? Since you don't like Sasha Banks and you don't like Zack Ryder, then my low shot's going to be Sami Zayn. Both the thumbing at you and because it's legit. He lost that ladder match and he didn't even get to compete in that fatal four-way. Yeah, that's a perfectly legitimate low shot, though. I feel like that makes a lot more sense than Sasha or Zack Ryder. Yeah, so Sami Zayn can eat my low shot, and apparently Kevin Owens can eat your... We're just going to do this till the end of time, aren't we? We're just like Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, except in fan support. Because I'm going to support Kevin Owens till the end of time, especially when it concerns... You're gonna, no, no, you're going to support Kevin Owens until Seth Rollins comes back to challenge him. Um, I don't know about that, actually. I do. I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't, because I, I love... Seth Rollins comes back... 
and Kevin Owens ends up with money in the bank and Seth Rollins beats Roman for the title and then Kevin Owens cashes in, you are going to be so torn. I, I think I'm going to side with it because I won an Owens world title run. I've already seen Seth with the gold. Granted, we haven't seen it with him him with it as a baby face, which I what think would be phenomenal. What if Rollins phenomenal. screws Owens out of a money in the bank? Oh, then then I hate Rollins. That, then we're, He's dead to me. He's dead to me because he just screwed fathers <laughs> everywhere. And he just screwed the greatest father on earth. Oh, because God, here's the man. thing. Sami Zayn needs to be abused until he learns his place. And then when he's a good bitch and he learns his place, then we can move on. So for right now, my conscience is good because all I know is Sami Zayn needs to be dealt with. And by dealt with, I mean put down. Because failures don't win. And I'm not about to have that change now on Sami's account. So, yeah. Kevin Owens, fine. You make him your little low shot, and you be proud of yourself, but it's not going to matter because at the end of the day, his good shoulder is going to be eating ring apron. So that's all I have to say about that. He's not going to a good shoulder anymore. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, but now, now the fun and difficult part. You know what? Because I kind of uh, germinated it, uh, I'm going to say that my honorary high spot is the tag team division. Because between yeah, that's a good pick. Yeah, honor, yeah. Because between Vaude Villains debuting on SmackDown, Preppy Co getting a vignette, and Enzo and Kaz debut being the cherry atop that glorious Sunday, while well, also New Day still is your babyface. WWE World Tag Team Champions, and no, I did not gyrate for the record. Uh, so oh, it's I a did. lot. I, go- I did all the gyration for you. You're welcome. That's amazing. Um, but yeah. A lot of great stuff going on for tag teams. They are my honorary high spot of the division because it seems like it's slowly rehabilitating itself. Uh, actual high spot. Oh, man. Because if we're including WrestleMania as well. Hmm. I have mine if you want me to go first. You can go first. I'm curious. Baron Corbin. Nice. I like that. Damn. I mean, the dude debuted at WrestleMania won his debut match, which was also his first WrestleMania match, and then proceeded to not lose his second match and just destroy Dolph Ziggler and cut a pretty decent promo all in the meantime. Yeah, you know, I just realized, given all those reasons, that no matter what I pick as my high spot, like, nothing's going to top that. So I'm just going to have a bit more fun with this one. Even though it doesn't take in WrestleMania, I'm going to say Cesaro. Because he's, he's healthy, he didn't, you know, he didn't win, but he wasn't a part of the losing half of the decision either. So he returned, he had a great match, and the crowd hasn't forgotten him, which is amazing. I, I'm not the, saying that they would have, but I'm always worried about injuries, like do people kind of pass over a certain guy or whatever. Cesaro has clearly carved a place in everybody's hearts, including mine. I mean, I very quickly shifted support. I can readily acknowledge that. Uh, it's great to see Cesaro back, proud member of the Cesaro section. So, yeah, he's my high spot because he's the first return of many, and it just made me feel so good. I know it made you feel good and your mom feel good and just everybody feel good. So, yeah, Cesaro's my high spot. Great pick. Yeah. Yeah. This is – um. wait, do we – did we agree, like, proposed WrestleMania Rose, that we don't necessarily do raw requests, or are we still going to have to try and come up with one? No, we like, do – we don't – We tr- in general, we don't do raw requests for pre – pre-pay-per-view that's right that's right post so i guess we're back to it guys so raw request oh, yeah this, this is really something um <sighs> oh my goodness you go first <laughs> oh well <laughs> my raw request is really simple really my raw request is try and keep Roman relatively organic. Like don't force him to be that cookie cutter or John Cena baby face. What he did on raw was perfect. Yeah, I can co-sign onto that, but I'll still come up with one of my own. My raw request. Thank you for giving me the time to think of one. Uh, just keep the interactions going between Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Like just, I don't know if it's like a promo exchange you want to do next week, or maybe it's like another attack. Sammy has a match and Kevin Owens comes out and he attacks him. Clearly, their first match is going to be at Payback in some way, and this is actually apropos because if you're the baby face, you know, and that would be Sami Zayn's this equation, you want Payback because Kevin Owens just robbed you of a potential WWE World Heavyweight Championship but match. But even then, they could be telling the story that Kevin Owens is after Payback because Sami cost him his title. 
Exactly. So it works both ways. So great marketing right there. WWE, where's our royalty check? Um, and yeah, they're probably not even going to go through with it. We're going to do like Owens versus Cesaro. Um, yeah, because we're so much su- uh, more superior than the WWE creative section. So Did you seriously just say more superior? Yeah, you know, I was trying to avoid it and I couldn't and I'm ashamed of myself. So yeah, we're, we're just so much more. Damn it. I did it again. Oh, <laughs> We're superior. We're superior, okay? To the WWE Graves. And we still are, because I may botch English, but they botch life We're and the lives so of so many more people. We're better than them, John. I know. I know. Fuck you, people. They're, <laughs> they're just so much more worse. Yeah, we're still getting Natalia Charlotte. And anyway, oh, yeah, geez. that, I just want to see those two interact i feel like if we were like sitting next to each other right now every time you bring that up it's like you giving me a metaphorical nut shot i know right so wonderful i can't believe that i just gave you that power i know right you're never that giving in that kind of way you're vulnerable but yeah interactions between zane and owens just need to continue you know, promos, physicality. This is one time where I could forgive physicality before a pay-per-view match because these guys just hate each other. It would actually be more off-putting if there wasn't any physicality. Yeah. Uh, so just keep it going. You know, and here's the thing, and I'm going to say this. I mean, yeah, you want Sammy to be sympathetic, well, but I, I don't want him entirely punked out. You know, he's got to give some to Owens as well. Yeah. So I'm hoping they kind of can walk that line. I'm not saying 50-50 booking either. Uh, obviously, if I'm saying that I think Kevin Owens should be money in the bank, he should probably be a bit more dominant, and it would do well for say, a Zayn sympathy anyway for Kevin Owens to win the feud, at least for right now, because you shouldn't have Sammy win unless there are more tangible stakes, you know, i.e. the world title or something like that. So just keep the feud going. Hopefully it goes well, and yeah, that's my raw request. Okay. All right, so is there any comments you want to make? You know, WrestleMania Raw, we talked about so much stuff, or do you want me to take us home? I think that you need to ask our audience the same question you just asked me. All right, guys. Is there anything you want to say? Or can I take us home? And I think they said take us home. So I'm going to do it. But seriously, guys, if you have anything that you want to add that we may have glossed over, that's why we have a comment section. We love hearing from you guys. And you can also, of course, tweet at us. But I'll get to that in a second with the go home because... This has been our WrestleMania. Oh, I thought you were going to say new day rocks. New day rocks. Uh, just because as soon as you get that build up, because it's like, oh, that's what they're doing. But no. Oh, Go yeah. Ahead. Well, resume, resume your outro. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, now, now I'm going to kind of limp there. But uh, because this has been our WrestleMania and post WrestleMania Raw review. And because this is TwitWow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today i'm john that's my cohort and commentary ashton guys be sure to comment and subscribe on youtube and i'm not even going to field this to ashton again what were your collective thoughts wrestlemania post wrestlemania raw did we forget anything is there anything you'd like to add to any discussion enzo and Cass? AJ is the new number one contender. I know that's a big thing. Talk to us, talk to us, talk to us. That's right. And you know what, dude? And you know what? I'm going to do this just to reward. To reward everybody that made it this far. Because right now, this recording has been going on for over two and a half hours. So just to reward everybody that made it this far, we are going to put out, for the first time, a little bit of a teaser. We want you guys to know that we do have a plan for the thousand subscriber special. That's right. That's we're, right. I mean, we've officially surpassed 900. Whether that'll last more than a day this time or not, I don't know. But the thousand subscriber special, when we hit a thousand, which is probably going to be in the next three to four months at most, we have a plan. We've got something in mind. We are going to do something special for it. And uh, we're hoping that you guys enjoy it. So be, just be prepared for that. Absolutely. You guys are amazing. And I can say this because you guys are so amazing. I know us crossing the threshold of 900 will last a hell of a lot longer than Zack Ryder's Intercontinental title reign. Oh, my God. <laughs> Eat my shit um, to Zack Ryder. Not to you guys. Love you guys. Yeah, Kiss and sunshine. Me. Um, so, yeah, be sure to comment. Be sure to take those conversations over to Puitoff. That is pro wrestling is taking over Facebook. Even the though group- John is taking a break from Puitoff. 
look, timing is everything, people. Johnny Scumbag's got a plan. Don't you worry your pretty little heads about it. And yes, I do think you're all pretty. Dude, Especially you've you. you've been taking this break for less than three days, and you already had people asking where the hell you were today. I know. That just shows you the kind of impression I made on the ground. I was kind of touched, but actually. What it shows you is how ridiculously active you are when you're not taking a break. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so there, there you go, guys. And, uh, yeah, so just go over to Puitov. It's crazy right now. Every championship pitcher is in upheaval. We do predictions for every pay-per-view, and there are great discussion threads always going on. So it's a great group, amazing wrestling fans, and friends. I might just actually have to made. try and win King of the Ring this year. Yeah, you know, I, I might even, uh, I don't know where I am with King of the Ring. I may have to actually opt out, because I never win, so I'm almost like, I'm just going to support whoever does win. I don't know. We'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But yeah, a lot of great stuff goes on, guys. Puitoff, an amazing group. If that isn't your thing, though, if you're like, eh, groups, no, no, it's okay, because we're on Reddit. Well, there you And we also have the TwitWow Facebook group. Yes, that's right. We are on Facebook, just the TwitWow Facebook page. You so can if like. you're not really into joining a wrestling group that has people from all walks of life and you only want to talk to other TwitWow fans, that's your go-to. And that's actually kind of amazing if you are that disposition, actually. We appreciate it. Well, I mean, so, I've, I've been there. Like, I used to well, – you and I – used to be really big fans of Mindcrack, which was just a small group of people that made a bunch of videos on YouTube gaming videos. Uh, and it's not like we were going to join the the gaming or the Minecraft subreddit, so we just joined the Mindcrack subreddit, and it worked out for the better. So I completely understand that, that state of mind. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, TwitWow well, Facebook page, like, share, comment on the content there, you know, get all those interactions in. If Facebook in general, I should say, isn't your medium of choice because instead of Mark Zuckerberg, it's Mark Sucksburgers because John's weird, we are on Reddit. And there you will find all of our TwitWow well content, and there you can also create threads on all things related to pro wrestling, but... If you want the premier TwitWow experience, if you want to revel in my agony when Zack Ryder wins a match, or if you want to remind me how much of a fan of Johnny Mundo I am and share those memes, you can do it on Twitter and read Ashton's tweets of brilliance, because I, I love when he live tweets like during a Raw or when he really hates a segment. We're both on Twitter. Follow us there. I am at John underscore TwitWow. That is J-O-H-N. You can't forget the H. And... Thank you. Thank you. That was actually a really impressive golf clap. And right. this guy. I can do it. Yeah, I, I could tell. I'm so proud of you. This guy is Apond404. That's the letter A is an amazing. Pond, P-O-N-D, the body of water. And 404, which the only time I've ever associated those numbers is an error when you can't load a web page. But this guy isn't an error. He's awesome. You want to follow him. So do that. Yeah, but when I made my Twitter name, I thought I was being cool because I was I was I actually made my Twitter when I was in college and I went to college for web design. So I thought, oh, I, I'm going to be clever. I'm going to incorporate web design into my Twitter name. I can't handle all the edge you're bringing right now. You're so edgy. <laughs> <laughs> Just call me Adam Copeland. <laughs> oh, snap. Uh, all right. Oh, my God. And we will see you again, guys. For our Lucha Underground live reactions. And then after that, Lucha Underground TwitWow. And it's going to be amazing because, obviously, until then, tune in and peace out.